1957, and the race fans of Southern California were anxiously awaiting the completion of a major motorsports facility to be known as Riverside International Raceway. Over the years, it's attracted the best drivers in the world and a wide variety of racing machines. But Southern California is growing, and the land that Riverside International sits on is now needed for a business complex and residential area. Already, expensive homes are just beyond the racetrack itself. The bulldozers are waiting to tear up Riverside and end its glorious history. But today, the Winston Cup drivers are here for the final time, and Ricky Rudd will lead the field to the green flag. Rudd is still feeling the effects of a crash during the Winston at Charlotte last month. But you would never know it. He set a new track record in qualifying here, a mark that will stand forever. Alongside in row one, Rusty Wallace, who won two of three races on road courses last year, including Watkins Glen and here at Riverside. And with a good finish today, he can take over the Winston Cup points lead. The final chapter in Winston Cup racing at Riverside is about to be written. ESPN, the world's leader in motorsports coverage, presents Speed World. Today, from Riverside International Raceway, the Budweiser 400. The weather is beautiful in Southern California. The temperature is 78 degrees. The fog is burning off, and we only have a 10% chance of rain this afternoon. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bob Jenkins. Welcome to Riverside International Raceway. This isn't the final race here at this facility, but certainly one of the last major sporting events here at Riverside. With me in the booth today is two-time Winston Cup champion Nair Jarrett, who has competed here on this track five times. We've got a different situation today, Ned. A road course. They're shifting gears and turning right and left. Which puts a real premium on the drivetrain of the car. We talk about the handling characteristics of the cars at most racetracks, and they are important here, but not so as important as the drivetrain. The engine, the transmission, the clutch, and all of the gearing takes a beating here because some of the drivers, depending on the type of transmission they have, will change gears as many as 10 times per lap. And boy, that really puts a premium on that transmission. Now, we've talked about tires in previous races. We'll have a little bit of a different tire problem here today, not so much in blistering or wear, but in cutting tires because if a car goes off of the track, kicks dirt and sand up on the track, these tires are so easily cut that we'll see tire cars coming into the pits with flat tires. Well, pit road is one of the tightest in all of Winston Cup racing. NASCAR has taken steps to slow the cars down as they come in for a stop. With more on that, here's the editor of Stock Car Racing Magazine, Dick Bergren. Bob, this is such a tight pit road that, in fact, we could expect this afternoon that several cars will actually be trapped on pit road while they try to change tires and work on their automobiles, trapped by other cars that have come in and are performing service. But more importantly, last fall, several crew members were injured on this very same pit road when several cars collided and there was an accident. NASCAR has taken steps to try to solve that problem and make this pit road safer by building a chicane. They've installed rubber pylons here at the entrance of pit road, and in order to get into the pits today, drivers are going to have to do it single file. They're going to have to line up one behind another. Now, we've never seen this, not only in Winston Cup racing, we've never seen it anywhere before. To make sure that the drivers pay attention to the rules on this deal, there are severe penalties. If they spin out on pit road or if they knock one of these pylons over, it's a one-lap penalty, very serious penalty here at Riverside. There's another way to get into pit road, and that's down here. They can come in the back way. They can miss turns eight and nine. But if you do that, it's a 30-second penalty. Nobody's tried this stuff yet, so we don't know for sure if it's going to work. We hope it does, and we hope we have a safe race here on pit road today. For another perspective on the last race at Riverside, here's Jerry Punch. Well, thank you, Dick. You know, over a century ago, settlers ventured west in search of fame and fortune. And similarly, three decades ago, many of the young pioneers in motorsports came west here to Riverside trying to make their name. Those that triumph are now legends in the sport. Names like Unser, Andretti, Foyt, Pearson, Petty, Yarborough, and Allison. Others lost their lives trying to conquer this tough old lady. Now, where I stand a year from now, there'll be a pool, possibly a playground, a tennis court, or maybe even a garden. But for today, what began 31 years ago when Eddie Gray crossed this start-finish line will come to a close. It's the final act of the final scene, and there are 43 Winston Cup stars perched and ready 
to make this final curtain call. Gentlemen. All right, thank you, Jerry. So we're set for the Budweiser 400 at Riverside International Raceway, the starting lineup in just a moment. Bittersweet day at Riverside International Raceway. Fans are anticipating a great race here, but on the other hand, they know it's the final one here at Riverside for Winston Cup. We take a lap around this historic facility with several of the NASCAR drivers. They come out of turn nine normally in third gear. And as you approach the start finish line, uh, you swing from the outside of turn nine. You swing across the little short chute there to the inside right up next to the flag stand. As you cross the start finish line, you normally would shift into high gear. You again clip the inside of the first turn there, kind of get the left uh, front wheel almost reared up in the air as you go through that first little turn there. The, one of the few left-handers on the course. The next thing you do is you head down into turn uh, two there. It's a fast corner. It's the setup corner for the S's. If you don't get in there just right, it'll mess you up to the S's. Uh, as you start into the S's, you can approach them inside, outside, inside as you enter up, uh, go into turn six, where you gra grab uh, second gear and uh, break real hard right there. When I pull over that pump at six, I go all the way back to first gear. I shift from first to second, run partially across there second, and downshift to first, just so I, just like a drag car, this back straightaway, it gives me four shifts coming up the back straightaway. So we're trying to let that motor and transmission do some extra work and try to get the car a good run down the back straightaway. You know, how you get into turn nine and get through the middle part of it and get off makes or breaks your speed around this racetrack. Uh, you know, you can kill time up through the S's and make it up down the back stretch or, or make good time up through the S's and lose it down the back stretch. But if you lose it in turn nine, you don't ever make it back up. And how critical it is, how fast you're running when you enter turn nine to get in a car, slow down into third gear and then accelerate off the corner. There's so much time to be made, and it's such a critical point going in. And that, to me, is probably the most scary, most scary part on the racetrack. And so there's a lap around Riverside International Raceway. The course itself is 2.62 miles in length, the backstretch 3,600 feet. There's an elevation change from the start-finish line out to about turn 7 or 8, where we have 100 feet. The race length, 95 laps, that's 400 kilometers, and the fuel range between 30 and 35 laps. And so the field now begins to uh, go around this race course on a couple of uh, pace laps before we get the green flag for 400 kilometers of racing. And here now is the starting lineup for today's Budweiser 400. On the pole with a new track record of 118.484 miles an hour, the Quaker State Buick driven by Ricky Rudd. On the outside of that front row will be Rusty Wallace in the number 27, Kodiak Pontiac. In the second row, it'll be Terry Labonte from Thomasville, North Carolina in the number 11 Budweiser Banquet Baby Ruth Chevrolet. Outside of row number two is Neil Bonnet in the 75 Valvoline Plastic Coat Pontiac. Row number three has Kyle Petty in car number 21, the Sitco Thunderbird. Outside of row number three, it's Dale Earnhardt in the GM Goodred Chevrolet car number three. Fourth row, Daryl Waltrip in the number 17, tied Exxon AC Chevrolet. Outside of row number four, the number nine, Coors Motorcraft 4, driven by Bill Elliott. In the fifth row, Dave Marcus in car number 71, the Lifebuoy Soap Chevrolet. And then Sterling Marlin in the Piedmont Underalls, Oldsmobile car number 44. Row number six, it's the Folgers Exxon AC Chevrolet, driven by Ken Schrader, car number 25. And then this Gold Bandit Chevrolet, which will be handled once again this week by Morgan Shepard from Conover, North Carolina, car number 33. Starting in row number seven will be Rick Henrik. Yes, the owner of the major race team in Winston Cup competition. He'll be driving the number 18 Levi Garrett Chevrolet. And uh, the guy that normally drives for him, Jeff Bodine, alongside in car number five. Going to row number eight, it is Mark Martin in car number six and Chad Little in 19, the fastest of the Winston West competitors. The ninth row has Brett Bodine in car number 15 and Lake Speed in 83. The 10th row, Dale Jarrett in 29 and Alan Kowicki in number seven. The 11th row consists of number 55, Phil Parsons and eight, Bobby Hillen Jr. The 12th row, Bobby Allison in car 12 and Tom Kendall in 76. The 13th row, Rick Wilson in car number four and Roy Smith in 79. Derry Cope in number 68 and Joe Rutman in 31 start in row 14. The 15th row has Richard Petty in car 43 and Benny Parsons in number 90. The 16th row, Rick McRae in 08 and Giacomo Giacomo in car 63. 
Buddy Baker and Davey Allison start in row number 17. In the 18th row, Herschel McGriff and Terry Petrus. The 19th row, Bill Schmidt and John Krebs. Going to row number 20, it's Jim Bound in car number one and Michael Waltrip in 30. And then in row number 21, the number 52 car of Jimmy Means and Ernie Urban in number two. And the 43rd starter, car number 32 of Provisional from the Winston West Division, Ruben Garcia. So there are your, there are your 43 starters for today's race here at Riverside. And we have a couple of in-car cameras that will uh, be leading us through this race here this afternoon. One of those is in the Superflow Motor Oils car driven by Rick Hendrick as he did an outstanding job in qualifying Ned starting today in number 13 starting position. Rick Hendrick is a good road racer. He has quite a bit of experience, not so much in Western Cup racing, but he has done a lot of road racing and uh, he proved that by having a good qualifying run. And the other in-car camera will be carried by Dale Jarrett in the Hardy's Oldsmobile as uh, he starts from the uh, 19th position. Bob, there's one driver starting way back in 30th position, and that's Benny Parsons, who has to feel that he's got a shot at winning this thing. Now, Benny is a former winner here at Riverside, always runs well here, but you figure someone starting back in 30th position might not have a good shot at it. But Benny, two racetracks that are no longer on the circuit, the Texas World Speedway and Ontario, Benny Parsons won the last race that was run at those two places. So if history and tradition have anything to do with it, Benny Parsons could very well be the winner here at Riverside this afternoon. We've been informed that the number 76 car driven by Tom Kendall will go to the back of the pack for the start because he missed the driver's meeting. There was a Corvette challenge race here early this morning that uh, Tom Kendall competed in and apparently there wasn't enough time between the end of that race and the driver's meeting and so he missed the meeting and he's been put back to the back of the field. By the way, that Corvette challenge race earlier today was won by Juan Manuel Fangio III in a very, very good contest. Now the field comes off of corner number nine and we are just about set to go racing for 400 kilometers. The Budweiser 400, the final race at Riverside International for the Winston Cup cars and the green flag is out. The field moves through turn number one. A short shoot now moving to turn number two. And now they begin to go through the famous S's here at Riverside International. It's kind of an uphill struggle through the S's as they negotiate the track from left to right, back to left, back to right, and then come uphill to corner number six. The bump is very narrow up through there. You saw how quickly they got themselves in single file as they came through the S's. Now across a short shoot, connecting turn number six to actually turn number eight because they missed turn number seven. The course is shortened for the Winston Cup cars, and so there is no real turn number seven. Through turn number eight now and down the very long backstretch, of course, the fastest part of this racetrack. That's Ricky Rudd that's showing the way. Rusty Wallace running in second position. And then Neil Bott at his third as they come down the backstretch and set their cars up for corner number nine, which is a big sweeping turn. And Ricky Rudd setting the car into turn number nine right now. And the first lap is about to be completed in the race as Ricky Rudd will be showing the way off of corner number nine and onto the main straightaway. Neil Bonnet is running third. Running in fourth position is Dale Earnhardt. In this spot is Terry Labonte. Sixth is Kyle Petty. Seventh, Bill Elliott. Eighth is Darrell Waltrip, ninth is Dave Marcus, and tenth is Sterling Marlin as we go inside the Rick Hendry car. You can see that he's holding his position very well as they head into the S's. He's doing a great job here in the early going. Well, Rick almost won a support race that was held here yesterday at the racetrack as we already have a uh, penalty assessed to the 0-4 car driven by Herschel McGriff. He was uh, apparently brought into the pits as a result of a black flag for jumping the start. So the old veteran Herschel McGriff has got some making up to do. And he was the grand marshal for this race, a very fitting honor for a fellow who has won more races here at Riverside than any other driver. Too bad that he's got so much time to make up now. Now we go back and check on the uh, those running up front. That's Ricky Rudd still showing the way. Rusty Wallace second. And then Neil Bonnet, who himself is still feeling some of the effects from a crash at Charlotte uh, last month, but has qualified well for this race and runs in third spot. Earnhardt right behind him. Then comes Labonte. That's uh, Kyle Petty, Bill Elliott, and the others trailing behind. 
Here we see Richard Petty's car coming into focus there, right there, making the left turn, the blue and red car. Richard crashed in qualifying on Friday here, had to go get a backup car. That's a 1987 model Pontiac, but he came back and qualified yesterday and running very well with it. As a matter of fact, Richard Petty was one of two of the regular Winston Cuppers to crash during the qualifying session. The other was Michael Walter. They had to get a show car off the display floor and bring it to the racetrack and qualify it. And uh, Michael Walter started this race from the 40th position. There you can see some of the action in the pack as they are pretty much now in single file formation up through the S's once again. Here comes the leaders out of turn number six, Ricky Rudd in the Quaker State Buick, still pursued by Rusty Wallace, and now a challenge settling up there for third position as Dale Earnhardt appeared to be in a spot to uh, possibly take over that third position from uh, Neil Bonnet, and indeed he has. So Dale Earnhardt moves to third now. Dale is fighting to stay atop the Winston Cup points race. The race is very tight. As a matter of fact, it's the tightest it's ever been at this portion of the season. Earnhardt has just a very slight advantage over Rusty Wallace. He has never won on a road course. He'd like to change that, and certainly before this racetrack goes away, he would like for it to be at Riverside, California. Look how he hangs that right front wheel right down on the white line as he goes into turn nine. We'll see a lot of dust kicked up during the afternoon here, and uh, most of it will just be for the right side or the left side of the car, getting off the racetrack slightly and kicking up some of the dust. But as you indicated, Ned, when they do that, they kick some dust and sand and gravel up onto the track, and that could result in some cut tires. Ricky Rudd leads the Budweiser 400 in the early going with Rusty Wallace wanting second, and we'll be right back after this. ESPN Speed World today at Riverside International Raceway as the curtain is brought down on Winston Cup racing here at this facility. Ricky Rudd, the pole sitter, is the leader, followed by Rusty Wallace. Dale Earnhardt is running in third position, and the number four car driven by Rick Wilson appears to have a problem as he's going behind the wall. Yes, that uh, Rick was running very well out there. Didn't know whether he'd be able to finish the race as a result of an injury that he got at Charlotte a couple of weeks ago. He had to have relief last week at Dover, Delaware, but now going behind the wall, it looks terminal, Bob. He had Jimmy Enzelow standing by as a relief driver, and it appears as if the car is uh, not running. And now the number 52 car driven by Jimmy Means has gotten off track and has stopped apparently of somewhere up there in the yeses. So a couple of cars dropped from competition here in the very early going and on pit road in front of us as we watch Watch Jimmy Means, the 63 car, driven by Giacomo Giacomo, is in the pit area. Here's a good battle between Daryl Walker in the car number 17 and Bill Elliott in car number 9. Right in front of them is Kyle Petty in car number 21. And right behind Bill Elliott is Dave Marcus, who is having a great run here in the car number 71, the Life Boy Soap car. Marcus perhaps has the best pit for Cucci here, Bob, that he has ever had. Ivan Baldwin, who's a pest winner here at Riverside, California, is now his crew chief and certainly knows how to set a race car up to get around this racetrack, and that's working to the advantage of Dave Marcus. Kyle Petty in the number 21 car is running sixth. Behind him, the 17 of Darrell Waltrip, then Bill Elliott, Dave Marcus, and the 44 car driven by Sterling Marlin. Six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 right here. We talked of the uh, tire situation going into this race. Only two drivers began the competition this afternoon on the Hoosiers, namely Jeff Bodine in car number five and Tom Kendall in number 76. Still watching Kyle Petty being pursued by Darrell Waltrip, and then here comes Bill Elliott, Dave Marcus, and Sterling Marlin. And there's caution on the racetrack. It'll be a full course caution because it's being given at the start-finish line, and Ricky Rudd comes into turn nine now. It'll be interesting to see if they come into the pits. And it looks like Rudd is slowing down. Rusty Wallace is not. He wants to lead a lap and get five Winston Cup bonus points. And here comes Rudd through that chicane that Dick Bergeron talked about in the opening of our show. Chicane put there in an effort to slow the cars down. There is very little room on pit road for these 43 cars. But here is Ricky Rudd now getting a change of tires on the left side of the car. Number 75 of Neil Bonnet is also on pit road right behind Ricky Rudd. And several others also come in, including Rick Hendrick, I mean, uh, Ken Schrader. Morgan Shepard is in, so is Jeff Bodine, Sterling Marlin, Bill Elliott, 
Lake Speed and others servicing on pit road. Now they're changing rubber on the right side of the car of Ricky Rudd. Let's go to Jerry Punch. Four time State Buick keep moves down pit road and just above run. Keep on Garrett Carr, Jeff Bodine getting tires and Bodine, one of the few drivers here that qualified him. The majority of the field of the air on the few tires. Bodine is blocking the pits behind Sterling Marlin. Move back up toward turn one. Cars begin to move back out onto the racetrack. There is Rusty Wallace, who's the leader, but he did not come in for a pit stop. And so he's right behind the pace car here in our first caution of the afternoon. Last week, of course, we saw a mandatory yellow thrown by NASCAR at the end of 25 laps for the drivers to come in to check their tire wear. But that was not the case here this afternoon. Wallace is in the lead. Dale Earnhardt running in second position as six laps out of 95 have been completed in the Budweiser 400. Field moving up through the S's under caution. We are cautioned to get Jimmy Means' tall car from the racetrack, but that has been accomplished, and now we'll go back to racing in just a few moments. The lights on the pace car are out, and we're set to go back to some green flag competition. Rusty Wallace is the leader. Dale Earnhardt runs in second spot. That's Terry Labonte third. Fourth is Kyle Petty. Fifth is Dave Marcus, and in sixth position is Chad Little, followed by Rick Hendrick, who is... Uh, Really doing a fine job out there. Now, he has also talked about getting out of that car and turning it over to Elliott Forbes Robinson. But the latest word we had from the pit area is if he feels comfortable out there and is having a good time, he's going to stay out there in competition. So we'll watch to see if Rick Hendrick does stay out there or if he turns the right over to Elliott Forbes Robinson. On the restart now as the green flag flies down the backstretch, that's Kyle Petty going to the inside trying to pick up fourth position. And he does move around. Well, he did for a moment move around <laughs> Dave Marcus, but Marcus uh, is going to beat him into turn nine. This is unquestionably the area of the track that we see the most competition in. And now we go inside Rick Hendrick's car and watch this battle. It's just up ahead of him. Chad Little's car is right there ahead, and so is Kyle Petty and Dave Marcus as they cross the start-finish line and head into turn number one. And Morgan Shepard in the 33 car is having problems. We see some smoke coming from the rear end of that race car. A tough break for Morgan, who had a tremendous run last week at Dover. And now we're beginning to see a battle shape up for the lead. See how the cars get off the course just slightly as they go up through the S's. That's Dale Earnhardt putting some heat on Rusty Wallace, the leader of the race. And Terry Labonte is right there also in car number 11. The cars come out of corner number six through the short stretch and over to corner number eight. Earnhardt would certainly like to take the lead and get those five bonus points back that Rusty Wallace picked up when he went into the lead. Earnhardt has not led the last two Winston Cup races, and that's very rare for him. In fact, I think there were only three or four races last year that he didn't lead at one point or another, and now he's gone two in a row without leading. The two drivers who are battling for the Winston Cup points lead are running first and second. Rusty Wallace is the leader of the race in second position in the point standings, and on the other hand, Dale Earnhardt, who is second in the race right now, is the leader in Winston Cup points as they come through corner number nine once again. And Rusty's car going high. Meanwhile, competition here as uh, Jeff Bodine in the number five car, Michael Waltrip in the yellow number 30, and Bobby Allison in car number 12 are having a battle out there. Of course, those cars had made pit stops and are coming back up through the pack. Bobby Allison was very strong yesterday in practice here, Bob. He started back in the 23rd position, but that was not indicative of the way that his car has been running here. Of course, Bobby Allison has won a lot of races on this road course and would like to be the winner of the last race here. As a matter of fact, there are, oh, you can see some dust being kicked up now, but apparently nobody is spun. It's a little difficult to see that three abreast racing through the S's as the visibility was reduced dramatically. However, it looks like everybody came out okay. Well, that is one of the problems. When a car gets off of the track, it kicks up a lot of dust, and it does uh, make it hard for the other drivers to see. It's uh, very dry out here, as we've had dry weather back on the East Coast for several weeks, and, boy, that dust doesn't take much to stir it up. We have a report of 
some smoke coming from the number one car, which is driven by Jim Bound from Portland, Oregon, one of the Winston West competitors, and the other is a tremendous amount of smoke coming from that car. So Jim Bound could very well be coming into the pits. Nine drivers in today's race have Winston Cup wins here at Riverside, and we were talking a little bit about Bobby Allison just a couple of minutes ago. As a matter of fact, Bobby Allison has the most wins, six. And there is Ricky Rudd threading his way through traffic and trying to move up through the field. He made a pit stop when we had the first caution and now is trying to move back and he has moved from 22nd, not to number 12. An unscheduled pit stop for Kyle Petty and the Wood Brothers Sitco Ford. Apparently he has run over something and cut a tire. They're changing the right side tires and here is a lot of smoke. Someone apparently got off of the track or maybe spun out. So much dust we can't even see the cars there. It'll be a while. Yeah, we do see a car down in there, but which one it is, it's impossible to see right now as the yellow flag does come out. However, as a matter of fact, there is more than one car. Bobby Hillen Jr. is one of those, off course. And still, could it be Davey Allison? It looked like Davey Allison's car. It is indeed. Yes. Both cars now get back on the racetrack. But we are yellow once again on lap number 12. Well, somewhat of a break for Kyle Petty as we see what we can, uh, if we can see what did happen as they came up through the S's. Kyle had just made a pit stop, so he got that, he'll stay in the lead lap. And here is... You can well, see they were already spinning. Davy Allison, it looked like, was spinning down on the inside. It happened just ahead of Ricky Rudd that we were following, and there you can see the damage on the left front of that car of Davy Allison, who has not had a particularly good weekend here. Not a very impressive uh, qualifying effort at all. He started back in 34th position. Now we have Dale Earnhardt moving on pit road, along with Dave Marcus, Rusty Wallace, Terry Labonte, also, a Chad Little is in and several others. Now, Dale Earnhardt's uh, pit is located at the very end of pit road. There is nobody ahead of him. The car uh, of uh, Rusty Wallace, number 27, is two back from Dale Earnhardt. As you can see, the uh, Larry Dotson crew going to work on that car. And let's go to the pit area for a report. Well, Barry Dotson and the crew changing tires on the Kodiak Pontiac at Rusty Wallace. They've already changed left side tires. Now that put fresh right side Goodyear rubber on the car. They did not pit, remember, on that first caution at lap six. So now they're blocked in the pits. They will back up and go around the Chad Little car. Earnhardt's car already has exited pit road. Earnhardt is away, and now Rusty Wallace moves away, as do several of the others who have come in for this stop on our second caution period of the afternoon. Bill Elliott's car is still on pit road. As a matter of fact, there is a the hood, is, the hood up. is up on that car. So something other than just a routine pit stop for the Elliott crew. And another car has gone off course. This under yellow, that's the 73 of Bill Schmidt, a Winston West competitor. Bob, it could be that we saw that smoke coming from Jim Bowen's car. It could be that there was oil on the track up there that caused those cars to spin. As we see Bill Elliott's car in the pits now with the hood up, Ernie Elliott, his brother, who is the engine builder, looking underneath there, making some sort of adjustments, or it looks like that he might be taking or wiring something up. Maybe that's gone wrong here. Well, we did see that similar situation with oil on the track in the S's yesterday during the International Race of Champions. Roberto Guerrero crashed after uh, Dale Earnhardt had blown an engine and spun in the S's, and also Chris Cord spun in the oil. So that could very well be what we have in this situation. There is Rick Hendrick in the Superflow Motor Oils car, and he is the leader of this race, so he picks up five Winston Cup bonus points, and, and so does Dale Earnhardt, who did lead a lap just before we went caution. Well, Rick, Rick Hendrick is coming into the pits, and apparently he's going to get out of the car because he's already taken his window net down, so he evidently is going to let Elliott Ford Robinson get in that car. We'll watch to see if Rick Hendrick does indeed get out. Elliot Forbes Robinson is standing by ready to get in. Here comes Rick out of the car. And Elliot Forbes Robinson puts in some padding on the seat as Elliot is not nearly as uh, tall and large in stature as Rick Hendrick is. But Elliot Forbes Robinson is being assisted as he gets into that car and will take over the controls. Let's go to Dick Bergeron. Well, I'm with Rick Hendrick. He's got a big smile on his face and a lot of sweat. Rick, how was it? It was good. I didn't want to get out of the car, but, you know, there was a plan to let Elliot get in. I might go back. Well, why did you get out of the car if you didn't want to leave? It's your car. <laughs> well, that was the deal. I had my fun yesterday. We thought we were going to win that race. And 
we had a great time, and the car's running real good today, and we led a lap, so I figured it was time I'd get out now. But you might go back in. Yeah, might go back. <laughs> he did. He almost won the race yesterday. Jerry Punch is in Bill Elliott's pit. Jerry, what's happening up there? Well, they're still working on the Bill Elliott car, and Elliott has now lost a lap sitting here with the hood up. They have a problem. The oil temperature went sky high in the car on that last time by, so they brought the car down pit road, have raised the hood, and now Ernie and Dan Elliott and some of the Coors crew are changing the hoses that go to the oil cooler, possibly an obstruction in one of the hoses, maybe a leak. Uh, they're trying to check it out very thoroughly. They don't want to burn the engine or blow it here on the road course, but they are losing a lot of valuable time. Already one lap here in the pits. The car that won last weekend on the high banks of Dover is not doing well here this afternoon at Riverside as they continue to work on that car. Now it looks like that Dale Jarrett and the Hardy Hillsmobile is the car behind the pace car and shown as the leader. How about that? First about time that. that Dale has led a Winston Cup race, I believe, in his career. I don't recall him having uh, been up front in any race, and I know that makes him feel good. Now we will point out that Dale has not made a pit stop uh, at either of these caution periods, but uh, he was running. He started in 19th position, had worked his way up uh, to 10th, before this last caution, and so now he finds himself in the lead. We are 14 laps into this race and caution because of some cars off the track. Well, helmets are a different variety here. Here is a Winston Cup track pack. Track packs are brought to you by the Robert Bosch Corporation, makers of Bosch Platinum, the ultimate spark plug. Companies are constantly trying to improve driver safety and comfort here in the Winston Cup Tour. And the latest in helmet technology is what I'm holding here, this new Simpson helmet. Now, the helmet normally worn by the majority of the drivers, like the Sterling Marlin, is this one here. This helmet has vents in the side. It has 7 eighths of an inch foam padding inside. And we are told this helmet weighs between 3 and 5 pounds. This new one, a limited edition Simpson, weighs less than 2 pounds. A significant weight reduction for the driver's head bobbing back and forth on a road course. It has side vents and has a lot more padding, an inch and an eighth. And most importantly, it has a carbon fiber Kevlar weave. Kevlar, what's using the space shuttle for heat resistance, keeps the driver's head cooler and lighter throughout the afternoon. The Budweiser 400 from Riverside International Raceway. We'll be right back with our live coverage. Several thousand Southern California race fans are on hand here this afternoon for one of the last races at Riverside International Raceway. Well, we know there are several, uh, at least two drivers that are watching our coverage today from their uh, recuperation beds, namely Harry Gant and his son-in-law, Larry Pollard. And we're very uh, pleased to report that Larry, who was injured in a crash last weekend during the Grand National Race at Dover, has been released from the hospital and is recuperating. And the best to both of you, gentlemen. It also gives us an opportunity here to run down some of the uh, winners that we have had in racing uh, this weekend earlier. Tommy Houston became the, what is it, the 12th, 13th uh, in 13 different races in Grand National Competition at Orange County last night. Also, uh, Shauna Robinson apparently became the first female to win a uh, NASCAR sanctioned race, the Charlotte Daytona event at Asheville. Won by Shauna Robinson last night. Of course, earlier today, you saw the finish of the Le Mans race in France. Jan Lovers and his teammates won that one. Ayrton Senna, we mentioned as the winner of the Formula One race, the Canadian Grand Prix near Montreal. And last night, we had the pleasure of going to the uh, CRA unwing sprint car race at Ascot Park near Gardena, California, and Leland McSpadden was the winner of that. The green flag comes back out on lap number 18, and we are back to competition. Well, Dale Jarrett uh, leading, of course, uh, Ricky Rudd right on his back bumper. Dale Jarrett leading, but Ricky Rudd is giving him a challenge as they go into corner number nine. Let's see how things shake out here. Rudd going to the high side up near the loose stuff. But that's not the place to pass on that turn. Now he dips down to the inside as he come off of the turn. That is the place to pass, and he's going to get Jarrett as he comes to start finish line. Ricky Rudd goes back into the lead, but Dale Jarrett is staying right up there with him, and some smoke coming. Looks like tire smoke coming from that Rudd car as he really had to bend it to get into that second corner. He had to make a pretty sharp turn to get in there because of the angle as a result of being on the outside of Jared. So Jared back in second. That's Richard Petty running in third position in the STP Pontiac as they come up through the S's once again. And now enter turn number six. 
Running in fourth position, Sterling Marlin in car number 44. Behind him is uh, Lake Speed, and now Richard Petty challenges for that second position as the cars move through corner number eight. To the inside is Petty, outside is Dale Jarrett, and Richard Petty has picked up second, and some contact it looked like there between Jarrett and Petty. Yeah, they might have touched up a little bit, got Jarrett out of shape, and he's lost several more positions, and plus the others have on fresh tires. Jarrett has not stopped as yet, but uh, I guess he just wanted the pleasure of leading the Winston Cup race for a while, so he stayed out there. And indeed he did. And by the way, the information we got from uh, NASCAR scoring was that Rick Hendrick did not lead a lap. He thought he did, but was not, not given credit for his last lap on the racetrack. You can see some great competition there ahead of uh, Jarrett as they're two wide going out of corner number nine. That's uh, Dale Earnhardt and Daryl Waltrip, Bobby Allison, and Lake Speed contesting for position. Look at Earnhardt get the left side off the racetrack and kicking up some dust. Well, that is some tight racing and some narrow racetrack. Normally, you don't see that much passing, Bob, on up through the S's, but they're just driving around there as if uh, there was plenty of room. Well, you remember last year, Dale Earnhardt with a really neat move going into the dust and picking up a position, and he uh, is using the S's in much the same manner here this year. Well, he loves this kind of racing. As we said earlier, he's never won on a road course, but but he likes, it sort of fits his driving style because you just slam her around the turns, drive it deep in, hit the brakes, and get on the gas. He likes that kind of racing, but so far has not been able to win on a road course. Although Dale Earnhardt has never won here at Riverside, his car owner Richard Childress owned the car that Ricky Rudd won with in 1983. Several drivers won their first Winston Cup race here at Riverside, California. Bill Elliott being one. Richard Rudd, of course, uh, won his first race here when he was driving for Richard Childress. Lake Speed apparently has slowed a little bit going into turn nine. And we look for him to come into the pits. Meanwhile, we continue to watch Daryl Waltrip and Dale Earnhardt. Behind those two, Terry Labonte. Earnhardt has been out of the top five for three consecutive races. The last time that happened was September of 86, when he was 21st at Dover, 12th at Martinsville, and 9th at North Wilkesboro. And you're right, Ned. Lake Speed comes to pit road. And this would certainly be an unscheduled pit stop. They go to work on the right side, so apparently he has cut a tire. So Daryl Bryant, his crew chief, Daryl, a former driver, goes to work on the car as we see Ricky Rudd leading Richard Petty. Richard Petty with five wins here at Riverside. Bobby Allison has the most. Darrell Waltrip has also won five races. Hey, Petty is not losing too much ground to Ricky Rudd. Petty, as we mentioned earlier, destroyed the car that he brought here to race, the 1988 Pontiac Grand Prix, in qualifying, going into turn six. And the brakes locked up and got into that turn too hard, hit the wall very hard and destroyed the car, so they had this 1987 Pontiac on the truck as a backup car, so that's the one he's racing and doing a good job with it. And Ricky Rudd, the pole sitter of the race, is leading at the moment, and we had a chance to talk to Ricky earlier in the weekend and ask him about driving on road courses. Really, my whole history, my background, you know, as a kid was, was road racing and go-karts. Now, even though that doesn't really compare too much, uh, I say I've been seeing these road courses since I was about eight, nine years old, ten years old. And I think maybe some of that comes back to me, some of the stuff that even though there were go-karts that ran 120 mile an hour, they didn't weigh but 200 pounds. Uh, some of the things you can learn from it, some of them you can't. And, and the motocross experience that I had on running motorcycles on the dirt, I think applies a lot here. And uh, sort of a freestyle. Everybody's got a different way of doing it. And I really wouldn't say one way is right or wrong, but sometimes one guy can get around a little bit quicker than the next guy. That's comments from Ricky Rudd. Meanwhile, Davey Allison just a few laps ago with a problem off the course, and now Dad Bobby has slid off the course, kicking up a big cloud of dust, but Bobby will get things going again and pull back out on the racetrack. I don't believe he hit anything, Bob. I think he just spun around out into the dust. It took him a little while to get oh. going. Here's Darrell Waltrip. Apparently, he had gone off of the racetrack as well. Well, it is a very narrow and tight racetrack up there through the S's, and we've seen several go off already. Darrell Waltrip is the latest. 
as he tries to catch up with the rest of the field and it's been a tough race already for Darrell Waltrip who made a uh, pit stop to be checked by the NASCAR officials for possibly dropping some oil and now look at the damage on the left side of that car yeah. he obviously I guess made contact with maybe Bobby Allison well he might have or either he, he could have but it looks like the damage is on the uh, on the underneath part of it and uh, there's some guard railing up there and in fact he's hit several things Bob because it's <laughs> damage all the way around on that race car just about every corner yeah we are in told in fact that he did come in contact with the guard rail up there among other things here's and Brett Budine with uh, smoke coming from the Crisco Ford and Bud Moore who's uh, still recuperating from a broken leg in Spartanburg South Carolina watching his car come into the pits Bud, we're sorry to show you the Crisco Ford coming in it looks like the engine has expired on that car he's headed to the garage area so it's out of the race for Brett Bodine, at least at the moment. Meanwhile, on the racetrack, we have some great competition as the number 18 car there of Elliott Forbes Robinson and Bill Elliott are running a nose to tail. Elliott, of course, trying to get back on the lead lap after a couple of very uh, long pit stops. And we have another yellow flag being displayed, and this one, we are told, is because of some oil on the racetrack that the track crews will have to come out and soak up. And that would be up in turn five, and it's going to be a break for Lake Speed, who Ricky Rudd was about to lap. We see Rudd coming into turn nine now, and Lake Speed is just ahead of him. Lake had made that unscheduled pit stop, so this will let him stay in the lead lap. So it's going to be a good break for him, and Ricky Rudd brings it into the pits. No big surprise. He stopped on that first caution period, so he's going to come in now. Dale Earnhardt is staying out there, but most everyone else, and uh, so is Rusty Wallace staying out, but most of the other drivers will be coming into the pits. So the Larry McReynolds-led crew goes to work on the left side of that car. Kenny Bernstein, of course, the owner of this machine. Kenny himself racing this weekend at Winston All-Star event down in Atlanta. They've changed tires on the left side of the car and move around to the right side to make a four-tire change. Of course, they have plenty of time to do that on the road course. As we mentioned earlier, it takes more than a minute, almost a minute and a half, to make a lap under green. So under caution, it certainly will take a long time. Richard Petty has service on his STP Pontiac and get it back out into the action. Others in the pits now include Sterling Marlin, Jeff Budine, Neil Bonnet, Kyle Petty, Ken Schrader, the Derek Coke car, and Alan Kowicki, Dale Jarrett, Bobby Allison now in. And here's a guy who did not come in for a stop, Dale Earnhardt, who is the leader. That's Rusty Wallace right behind him. Now, both of those drivers had made pit stops during earlier caution periods, so they decided to stay out this time since it looked like that we're going to have uh, maybe more caution flags here today than usual, Bob. You know, we, uh, we have seen uh, two groups of cars, so to speak, uh, that are uh, on pit road and that I think is something that NASCAR really wants in order to keep all of the guys from coming in at the same time the pits are so narrow here down to the pits once again Bob, one of the cars is going to stay on pit road for quite a while is Bobby Allison I hope you can see it on your screen right now there's water squirting through the grill on the number 12 automobile apparently in that shunt he has punctured the radiator a lot of water leaking Bobby Allison is in trouble today for sure he has had his trouble with his racetrack even though he's the winningest driver here he once lost the national championship with a flat tire right at the very end of the last race from one year's event at Riverside Bobby Allison goes back out onto the racetrack nevertheless but it appears as if just a matter of time before he'll have to bring that car in again with a tremendous amount of water coming through the grill. As we mentioned earlier, Bobby was very fast in practice here yesterday afternoon and uh, was one of my picks to win this race today, even though he started back in 23rd position. But now having the problems, I think that's going to certainly reduce his chances of winning here today. And so Dale Earnhardt now will not go three races in a row without leading a lap. He uh, has put that Goodrich Chevrolet out front here now, so that will give him the five bonus points that goes along with leading. And here's Darrell Walter coming into the pits with a lot of damage done all around on that car. Let's go to Jerry Punch. 
Well, as you said, Ned, and you and Bob said, every corner of this car has been bent somewhat to tie Chevrolet. They're going to work on the left side of the car. Eddie Dickerson, Jeff Hammond, and the crew changing left side tires and cleaning the windshield. One of the biggest problems Darrell had, and he couldn't see, and the windshield was covered with dirt and some mud. Now they come around to the right side of the car and will change the right side tires. Apparently, most of this has caused medic damage, apparently very little chassis damage. That's good news for the tie crew, as they are working on the car and having four fresh tires. Darrell said the car drives awfully well. He did not lose a lap in that little chicane up there in the essence, and now with fresh rubber, he's ready to go at him once again. Four, four fresh tires for Darrell Walter, former winner here. Lot to get the last win, Riverside Raceway today. They're going to bend some sheet metal away. The car comes off the jack, they will check it over and pull some of the sheet metal, and Walter will be out in just a minute. And Jerry, as you speak, Lake Speed has taken his car into the garage area. We mentioned that he was able to stay in the lead lap, but now he has taken his car into the garage area. And now we see the hood go up on Darrell Waltrip's car as they continue to work on it. Several having trouble here in the first 24 laps of this race. Well, we have been sampling the opinion of some of the race drivers here, some of those who have competed for the past few years on Riverside, asking them about their memories of leaving Riverside. Well, I'm kind of sad to see it go. I've had a lot of good runs here. I've had some problems here and a few heartbreaks here, but uh, I'm kind of sad to see it go. We're under our third caution because of oil on the racetrack up in turn number five, but we will be going back to competition as the cars go down the backstretch. And here is Lake Speed in for another stop. So we've seen several of uh, those that you consider real potential winners visiting Pitt Road quite regularly. Here is Daryl Waltrip in again. And as you see in the background, Davey Allison is pulling out of the pits as they have gotten the sheet metal away from that car. Bobby Allison remains on pit road. Let's go to Jerry Punch. They will do some managing on the Darrell Walter car. They take the duct tape and will cover over some of the open puncture wounds on the left side of the car where some of the sheet metal has been peeled away. Walter pulling the car as smooth as possible. They run almost 170 miles an hour on that backstretch, so it's very important to have the car as sleek and slippery as possible. The corners of the car where it's been shoved in on the right front and right rear, nothing they can do about that, but they will peel over some sheet metal on the left door. And Bob, as we saw Lake Speed going out, he was actually coming out of the garage area. He had gone into the garage area. Don't know how much time he lost in there, but whatever was wrong, they were able to get it repaired, so he is back out on the track. Meanwhile, Bobby Allison is still in the pits as we see Darrell Walter trying to catch up to the field because the green flag is waving once again. We're back to racing. And Dale Earnhardt is the leader on lap number 26 as we go back to caution. Rusty Wallace getting past here. He was second behind the pace car, but now falls all the way back to fourth as uh, Phil Parsons has jumped into that second position right behind Dale Earnhardt. Now Rusty has third position back, and uh, fourth is going to be the number 19 car driven by Chad Little. And Chad, who is the defending Winston West champion, is doing a fine job and certainly has to be considered as a potential winner of this race. I would think that he would be. He's an attorney by trade and uh, a very fine race driver. There he is in the number 19 car, right ahead of Roy Smith in the 79 red car, who's also a regular on the Winston West circuit. Bob, well, one interesting point. We said there were only two drivers that started on Hoosier tires here today, and Jeff Bodine was one of those. He has since switched to Goodyear tires. And you can see several cars getting off of the course as they once again move up through the S's, kicking up the dust. Now through turn number six once again in single file formation. Every once in a while you can get off and make a straight shot across one of those dirt places and get by with it, but it's not very often as that car did. 79 car just a little bit sideways through the corner there as Davey Allison comes on to uh, actually into the garage area. They worked on that car on pit road, did a tremendous amount of work on it after his spin off the track, and now apparently not working too well, took it back into the garage area. While he's doing that, his dad, Bobby, pulls out onto the racetrack after having lost time in the pits. Dale Earnhardt now begins to stretch out the lead once again as we follow the number 79 car driven by Roy Smith, who is fifth. And Rusty Wallace has gotten by Phil Parsons. And so Rusty reassumes second. He simply outbraked him going into the turn nine. He really drove in hard there as Phil backed off a little bit going into that turn. Rusty just drove her deep on down in there and went around Phil. So Rusty lost two positions on the restart. The car just didn't seem to go when 
and he stepped on the accelerator and the green flag dropped, but he has since moved back up to second spot, now dropping Phil Parsons back to third. There's the uh, lead that Dale Earnhardt has gotten, but Rusty, it appears to be uh, catching up and closing in. Once he got around Phil Parsons, I think he did start picking up on Earnhardt. We'll watch that. Earnhardt followed by Wallace, then Phil Parsons. In fourth position is Chad Little. Fifth is Roy Smith. In sixth position is Rick McRae. Seventh is Ernie Irvin. So a lot of these Winston Western guys are showing in the top 10 with 27 laps completed. Bob, as Jerry Punch mentioned at the top of the show, the first NASCAR sanctioned race was run here in 1958. And then they didn't come back until 1963. I had the good fortune of running in that race. And of course, they've run every year here since then with the Winston Cup Series. Dan Gurney won the first four races here. He, he just was unbeatable because he was such a smooth race driver. And that's what everybody said that it takes to get around a road, road course, as we see Terry Labonte moving up the outside of Ernie Irvin. They said you have to be smooth and methodical to get around a road course. Well, Rusty Wallace is one driver who doesn't subscribe to that theory. He simply manhandles the car. Well, Dale Earnhardt does about the same thing, too. But it has changed over the years, but we have to point out that the cars are so different today, they will take more abuse than the cars did back in those days, and there's a whale of a lot of competition out there as well. Here is a car into the fence hard. We can't get a number. It's uh, Ruben, Ruben Garcia. Has Ruben come Garcia. outside of the, the, the racetrack into the corner of uh, really the corner of the grandstand. Oh, boy, it's, uh, it's a miracle that uh, the car did not go into an area of spectators right down here. This is right to the left of, rather, the right of our broadcast booth. And it's an area where uh, there is no guardrail. There is an opening as the cars come off of corner number nine before the guardrail begins to protect the spectators here on the front stretch. And he has crashed through a tire barrier and is uh, also right in front of the scoring stand. And it looks like that's a place that it looked like it would be impossible to get into, Bob, with the race car, but don't know what position he got into that threw him over in that direction. Let's see if we can, can pick it up and see how what did happen as he's coming off of the track. He's out of control as we see him coming across there. Now watch and him. He watch him hits that barrier, just the corner of it, and the car goes up into the air, hits oh. the other concrete wall barrier there, and right in almost into the spectator area. And you can see the spectators scrambling for safety. It looks like from our vantage point here that they were okay, thank God. They sure did scramble to get out of the way, though, as he broke through a uh, concrete barrier. But it appears as if, and we haven't received any word from many of the safety officials, but it appears as if everybody is okay. There was some catch fencing there protecting uh, the racetrack from the spectators. Let's go to Dick Bergeron. Bob, from my vantage point, that looks like exactly what happened, that the safety measures did indeed protect the spectators. In fact, there is a wall that's between where the spectators are and where Garcia's car went, and that is a key factor in keeping everybody okay in this particular situation. So a very unusual accident here as we see it again. That's Ruben Garcia coming off the course just out of turn number nine, going through this guardrail, scattering the tires, going through some catch fencing, breaking through a concrete barrier. But again, there is catch fencing then that protects that area from the spectators. And that's what apparently has prevented any serious spectator injuries. And that was one of our ESPN camera cables that was snapped as well as he went in there. Boy, that, that is a, a very rare type of a situation. Boy, and, and to think that he went through such a narrow opening there is mm -hmm. just hard to believe. And through two walls. Yeah. And okay, here, here we're going to see it at normal speed, and you can see he's coming through there at a pretty good clip. He knocks that wall down, hits that one, and the spectators begin to scramble as quickly as they can. Of course, as you mentioned, there is a wire fence, but just in front of where the car stopped. So that certainly had to worked to the advantage of the spectators there and perhaps caught some of the debris, some of the block that was flying from that wall. Hmm. Ruben Garcia, the driver involved, as now we see the number 19 car of Chad Little shown as the leader of the race, but we are under caution for the fourth time 
with a total of 29 laps completed in the Budweiser 400. There are many attractions here at Daytona USA, but at this particular moment, the big attraction is you. him. <laughs> How many people here are Benny Parsons fans? Yay! See? How about Bob Jenkins? Yay! See? That's about even. <laughs> Okay, we continue with our NASCAR marathon. We are at Riverside, and we just witnessed a crash involving Ruben Garcia, and that was pretty scary because he almost went into the crowd. I mean, what is it with these crashes? The last time we saw Bobby Allison in the fence at Talladega, and now Ruben Garcia jumps the guardrail coming off turn nine at Riverside and into the crowd. And how about Ricky Rudd? You kind of know that when you go to a road course that he's going to be strong, and he is today. And Rusty Wallace, Terry Labonte. And in years to come, those three would almost dominate the road courses. But Chad Little is the leader at the moment. Chad Little from Spokane runs on the Winston West Series, has come down to Riverside, and is running pretty doggone good. Okay, let's go back to June of 1988 at Riverside. By the way, Benny is running seventh as we rejoin the action. <laughs> ESPN Speed World at Riverside International Raceway for the Budweiser 400. And the word is that this race is going to be red flagged on lap number 32. And the reason is because of this accident that involves Ruben Garcia. And it's a very unusual accident. He tore through a set of guardrails and into uh, some concrete block and very came very close to going into a spectator area the nascar fields are just going to have to do something to make a barrier down there and protect these spectators from any possible other crash that might occur it was just off of corner number nine and so it appears as if the red is coming out indeed it is and we're going to be stopped here for a while and uh nascar is going to have to determine what they can do to keep the spectators safe and dick bergren is down to Ruben Garcia is walking across the racetrack, and he's just about to Dick Bergeron. Now, let's go down in that area. Well, Ruben Garcia, most importantly, are you all right? You look all right. Well, you know, the, 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 the worst th thing about it, you know, I, I was taking that Pick Your Part Quaker State Chevrolet Monte Carlo out there, and I thought I was doing really good, you know, and we were running right there about 18th in the car. We were having trouble all day long with the car, but some broke, you know, and I don't know what happened. I'm just sorry that I'm out of this last race. I'm really proud of, you know, nine out of times, I've Nine out of nine times I've been able to come out here and, and, and race in this race, and it's really sad that, that it happened to me. I'm really, really sad about it. But you still managed to get a smile when you jumped out of the car and everybody was okay. Hey, listen, I love L.A., and that's what it's all about. And this gentleman is one of the true gentlemen, one of the real sportsmen of this automobile racing area. He helps an awful lot of other racers who are down on their luck. He's a self-made man. He has sponsored more than dozens of cars for people who would like to race but just can't afford to do so. So Ruben Garcia is okay. Meanwhile, the cars are rolling to a stop here on the main straightaway, and the Budweiser 400 is under a red flag condition. As you look at that replay time after time, Ned, you can see that when he hit that concrete barrier, he sent whole complete blocks flying into the yes. air, and it's just a miracle that one of those didn't fly over that catch fencing and go into the, the uh, spectator area. So far, we have had no report that spectator was injured or anything of that nature and it is a miracle that something didn't fly over that area that was Les Richter that we had a shot of walking across the track of course Les uh, now a NASCAR official but for many years was the uh, manager here at Riverside International Raceway and he is walking across the track and back into the garage area as the car of Ruben Garcia is being taken from the race course and he said something happened, something broke on the race car that he, I guess, had no steering, and it just shot across there. He was at the mercy of wherever it wanted to go. Well, we have an opportunity to check in with our pit reporters. Let's go to Jerry Punch. Well, gentlemen, we've been told by NASCAR that they are going to obviously try to repair that barrier up there. What their plans are is to take a forklift, bring a forklift out to pick up some large chunks of concrete and lay them down. They don't have time to put guardrail up here. And we'll try to put some concrete barrier down to block off that opening where Ruben Garcia peeled in there. Apparently, the good news is we haven't heard of anyone being injured, as Ned said. That's awfully good news. He went through a couple of barriers. Even Ruben Garcia is okay. But NASCAR very busy trying to get that concrete picked up by a forklift outside the racetrack and brought in to close that opening before we go back to green flag racing. Gentlemen? Okay, so there's the explanation of how they're going to uh, 
make some repairs and get this race back underway, but it's likely to be quite a while before we go back to red. And again, we have a sampling of drivers who have raced here at Riverside on their most vivid memories. Your most vivid memory of all the races you've run here? Well, I think my first win here was probably the biggest thrill because I, I had just come back after a long layoff and uh, it was a close finish. It started raining and uh, the two lead cars, which I was one of them, we both spun out and I beat the other car to the finish line. I can remember coming out here that race, which was 68 at that time. And, and uh, he didn't do too good that year, but switched to Ford the next year and he won the race. But, you know, it, it was just the thrill of being eight years old and being able to come out across the country with your father and, and ride in a truck and get to see all the race cars and, and meet guys like uh, Dan Gurney and Parnelli for the first time because that was the first time, even though I'd heard about them and heard my father talk about them, I never met them. So uh, I think that's still my, my most vivid memory of Riverside. We uh, won three championships here and coming out of turn nine and looking in, in the pits and seeing the crew hold up, you're the champ. Having that happen three times made me makes me uh, awfully fond of this place. My most vivid memory is not of a Winston Cup event. I broke my back here in a crash in the IROC series uh, several years ago on a Saturday, and then I won the race on the following day. Uh, you know, that still stands out as the, uh, the high and low for this place for me. In 84, when we came out here and uh, we won the pole position, and we won the, uh, the championship that day and finished third in the race. And uh, I'll never forget that. That was, uh, that was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, just one of those days where everything went right for us. It's probably the most vivid memory I've got is I went through the S's and turned four one time and dropped the right wheel off and car came back up and I hit the brakes for turn five and I'd cut a brake line in two. I had nothing, zero. I said, gonna be a big wreck here in just a second. And there was. Right now, the vivid one is I'm going to shoot that guy revving that motor up. <laughs> well, the most vivid memory, undoubtedly, for Ruben Garcia, his crash that has brought a red flag to the proceedings here. Ruben is okay. We'll be right back. We're back at Riverside for ESPN Speed World on this Sunday evening, actually on the East Coast. It's about quarter of three here uh, in the Western time zone. The Budweiser 400 is under red because of an accident that occurred out of turn number nine. Some of the uh, barriers and some of the fencing was torn down when a car went through that area. So we've been under red to make repairs and bring in barriers. And here is again the crash, Ruben Garcia, the driver involved. Something broke on the steering on his car as it came off of turn nine and he crashed through the first barrier and then through a fence into a concrete wall, went right on through it up to another fence that separates the spectators and you can see the spectators scrambling for safety. We have no report of any injuries. Miraculous situation, so they did bring in some barriers and now have the spectators uh protected up in that area so we are ready to go back to racing here in just a few moments there are 32 laps completed so we're a third of the way into the Budweiser 400 and at the moment Chad Little in car number 19 is the leader Ricky Rudd is second Terry Labonte is third Sterling Marlin fourth and Jeff Bodine is fifth running in sixth position is Ken Schrader seventh is Benny Parsons eighth is Kyle Petty in ninth is Dale Jarrett. Tenth, Derek Cope. In eleventh, Michael Waltrip. Twelfth position belongs to Terry Petrus. Thirteenth to Phil Parsons. In fourteenth is Neil Bonnet. Running fifteenth is Rusty Wallace. Sixteenth is Daryl Waltrip. Seventeenth is Dale Earnhardt. The 08 car of Rick McRae is running eighteenth. Then Richard Petty is nineteenth. In twentieth position is Roy Smith. Twenty-first, Mark Martin. 22nd, Rick Hendrick now being driven by Elliott Forbes Robinson. The 04 car is shown in 23rd position, that's Herschel McGriff. In 24th is Alan Kowicki. 25th, Buddy Baker. 26th, Ernie Urban. In 27th position is the 76 car of Tom Kendall. Then comes the 73 of Bill Schmidt. 66, John Krebs. The 31 car driven by Joe Rutman. Dave Marcus, then a lap down is Bill Elliott in car number nine. 
two laps down is Bobby Allison. Also two laps down is Lake Speed. And eight laps down is the 63 car driven by Giacomo Giacomo. So there are all of the cars that remain uh, on the racetrack. And it's interesting to note that Bill Elliott is lined up between Chad Little and Ricky Rudd. So when we go back to green, Bill Elliott will be trying to get his lap back by passing the leader, Chad Little. And in case you just joined us, Bill Elliott lost a lap in the pits during one of the earlier caution periods when uh, something went wrong that caused the oil temperature to go up on his course forward. They worked on it, made some repairs. He got back out, but he did go one lap down during that stop. We were red for 25 minutes and five seconds, but now the cars are back out on the racetrack. Again, they're getting the temperatures up on those cars before we go back to green flag conditions. And we must compliment the uh, track safety workers here at Riverside because they have made repairs down in that area very quickly considering all the damage that was done. And you can see there the two barriers that were brought in on forklifts that now separate the racetrack from that spectator area. And Bob, two cars that have been out for a while, one of those is Rick Wilson in the Kodak car. They've made repairs. Rick told us earlier that he did plan to get back out to replace the transmission in that car. And Davy Allison had gone into the garage area for a while. He, too, has gone back out onto the race course. Well, this red flag was certainly beneficial to them because they were able to make 25 minutes worth of repairs to their car and essentially not lose anything. No, nope, can't do that. Can't work on the cars That's during right. a red flag period. You're in fact, a NASCAR official will stand by. If they're working on a car, when a red flag comes out, they have to stop. But the moment then the clock restarts, they are able to start work again. There is Lake Speed going back out onto the racetrack. Meanwhile, they continue to work on the Dave Marcus car. Well, he just came into the pits. Dave had been running very well here today, but he just came in as they came by to get the signal. They'll get the green flag once they get up to turn eight. Whatever they were doing under the hood, they've completed that. Rechecking the tire to see that they're tight. They push Dave off and away he goes. And the 66 car of John Krebs also in for a tire change. And they now move over to the right side of that car to change all four. His, uh, his dad is one of the NASCAR officials, Art Krebs. And uh, his John's mother back home in Charlotte, North Carolina, watching her son race here today and always very anxious to know what's going on. So we're glad to get a shot of him making a pit stop and he's uh, back out or about to go back out in the action. And the green flag comes back out on lap number 34. We are racing again at the Budweiser 400 Winston Cup race, the final Winston Cup event at Riverside International Raceway. We've been red, but now back to green and the racing resumes on the track. Chad Little. The defending Winston West champion is leading, but look at Bill Elliott and the number nine Coors Motorcraft Ford passing Little and getting a lap back. Now Bill Elliott needs a caution period once he's got in front of the leader, but Ricky Rudd is coming back up very strong, and Rudd is shown to be the fastest car on the racetrack most of the afternoon. It'll be interesting to see if Bill Elliott can stay out in front of him. Battle for the lead. Now Ricky Rudd has it. Battle for second position. Sterling Marlin has it as Chad Little drops back to third. Jeff Bodine is in fourth and Terry Labonte in fifth position as they come up through the S's. Elliott is leading the group here but has gotten his lap back and is not the leader of the race. That distinction belongs to the green and white Quaker State Buick number 26 driven by Ricky Rudd. And he's closing in on Bill Elliott, Bob. He We'll try to put him a lap down here as quickly as he can because he knows that if Bill Elliott stays in the lead lap that he can be a strong contender. They come out of corner number eight and go down this long back stretch in which speeds reach around 140 miles an hour. The average qualifying speed here this weekend, the pole sitter Ricky Rudd qualified at 118.484. As now uh, we see Little continuing to drop back. Terry Labonte is passing Chad Little. And now Little is positioned right ahead of Kyle Petty on the racetrack. Here's a battle between Jeff Bodine in car number five and Terry Labonte in car number 11. Both of those accomplished road racers. This is the battle for third position. Labonte putting the heat on Jeff Bodine. They cross the line. Looks like they may have had contract there. On the straightaway before they went into corner number one, Jeff Bodine is in third position, Terry Labonte in fourth. 
And we saw Kyle Petty move around Chad Little and take over the fifth position. Up through the S's once again. Jeff Bodine showing a little bit of damage on the left front side of that race car. And now we see Elliott remains ahead of Ricky Rudd on the racetrack. So Elliott is on the lead lap, but Rudd is right there on his back bumper and some smoke coming from the Bodine car. Probably just tire smoke, though, as he breaks going into corner eight. Could be, but boy, Terry Labonte is really putting the pressure on him. Here they come down the back stretch. Labonte will go to the high side, the outside of the racetrack, and he will pass Jeff Bodine. And so Terry Labonte now moves into that third position. Second is Sterling Marlin, the leader, Ricky Rudd. Then comes Jeff Bodine and Kyle Petty, followed by Chad Little, then Ken Schrader, Benny Parsons, and Dale Jarrett. Labonte's car seems to be working very well. He's in the red and white number 11. Of course, he sets his sights now on Sterling Marlin, who's running in the second position. We've already had four caution periods in the first third of this race. And oh, there's some big smoke coming from the Jeff Boat Icon. Even some flame coming from the exhaust pipes. And he's staying out on the racetrack. Now, I don't know if there's any oil coming out from that car or not, but a lot of smoke. And boy, that could be trouble for the cars behind him because if there's oil coming out of that car, and apparently it's not because Kyle Petty coming up on him and is able to get good traction as they go up into turn six. That's certainly not the area of the racetrack that you want to put down oil, though, through the S's. No. But uh, apparently there is no oil coming from that Bodine car, although he appears to be slowing now as he approaches car, uh, turn number eight and will be black flagged by the NASCAR officials. Car still running at a pretty good clip, so whether he's broken an oil line or what it is, it's, it, it looks like oil smoke, quite a bit of it coming from the car, but he's still able to run good. As he heads down the back stretch, he's running very strong, Bob. Sure is, staying ahead of Kyle Petty, but as we indicated, the word from NASCAR is that he will be black flag as he comes by the start-finish line this time. Now Kyle Petty going to the outside of the racetrack and passing Jeff, so Jeff obviously knows that there's something wrong with that car. Let's well, see what happens here in turn number nine. If he'll drop down to the inside and come in for a pit stop. I'm sure that uh, the NASCAR officials have told him that he would be back black flag, that he indeed is coming into the pit area. Let's go to Jerry Punch, who is there. Well, again, a tough break for Jeff Bonner and the Levi Garrett Chevrolet. Waddell Wilson told me a minute ago that Jeff said on the radio the car was going to be running fine, just smoking very, very heavily. So dead speculation of possibly an oil line or something that may have ruptured on the car may be indeed accurate. They are going to raise the hood and a cloud of smoke comes from beneath the hood. And now Jeff Bonner will shut, shut the car off and they will look to try to find out what the problem is. This is the same race car that Bodine was here with last November with and was dominant here at Riverside. He led the most laps and seen to be on his way to victory with 11 laps to go he cut a right front tire and finished back in the field and again tough yes. break for Bodine at Riverside California the Rick Hendrick team entered four cars for this race and two of them have been in numerous times for pit stops Jeff Bodine and Darrell Waltrip the other two driven by Ken Schrader and the car now driven by Elliot Forbes Robinson are still out there in competition there you can see Bill Elliott leading uh, Ricky Rudd, but Bill is simply getting his lap back. The leader of the race is Rudd in number 26. Back with more of the Budweiser 400 right after this. And Ricky Rudd has now put Bill Elliott a lap down once again. Rudd leading in the Buick, and as you can see, the last win in 1982 when Tim Richmond did it. And uh, Ricky let the car slide out a little wide there in turn number nine, and Elliott is right there on the inside to challenge him as the cars come out of corner number nine, but Ricky Rudd holds him off, and Bill Elliott goes a lap down once again. Here's the race for second involving Sterling Marlin in car number 44 and Terry Labonte in number 11 as Labonte is having a fun run this afternoon, so for that matter is Sterling Marlin. The body of former winner here, Sterling Marlin, has never won a Winston Cup point race. He won the Winston Open at Charlotte a few weeks ago, but uh, he has certainly picked up on how to drive a road course, doing a good job, even though he got his wheels off the course just a little bit there, but he's holding on to the body. One of the drivers that uh, you just know is going to win a race sometime is just a matter of time. 
And we have word from the pit area that the number seven car of Alan Kowicki is pulled behind the wall. So all of you Wisconsin racing fans that pull for Alan Kowicki, it'll uh, be uh, a uh, non-finish for Alan Kowicki. Jerry Punch is in the pit area. Well, they have pushed the Levi Garrett Chevrolet behind the wall, Jeff Bodine getting unhooked, but they are still working on the car, Jeff. What's wrong? Uh, we never give up. <laughs> I don't know. We went around the uh, the second corner and the car started smoking. Uh, we made another lap and then it got real bad and the engine started to skip. We have really no idea what's wrong. Uh, sometimes after you stop an engine during a race and restart it, you crack cylinder heads, you break things. Uh, looks like that might have happened to us. Uh, right now we just don't know what's happened. Uh, we're going to try to fix it and get back out there. We're having a lot of fun. It's no fun sitting in here. Hi, kids, son. You'll be home in a little while. Oh, Jeff Bodine, tough break for him. Let's go up pit road to Alan Kowicki's pits and Dick Berger. Dick? Well, Alan Kowicki has just pulled in here, and there's a lot of water behind the car, and no wonder why all the belts are off. Alan, what happened? It, uh, the, the pulley broke off the front of the engine. It lost all the oil pressure, and I'm sure it damaged the engine, so it looks like we're out for the day. Well, they're going to push him into the garage area anyway, just in case these guys don't want to quit, but it sure does look bad. All the pulleys are gone from the front. The fan even is damaged in the car. Alan Kowicki behind the wall, so is Jeff Bodine, but the action continues on the racetrack, and the best battle is for second. As you can see, Terry Labonte in car number 11 has passed Sterling Marlin in car number 44, so Labonte now second, Marlin back to third. The leader of the race continues to be Ricky Rudd. And after he moved around, Bill Elliott, he has really moved away from him, Bob. So Ricky Rudd is hooked up. Now we can see Kyle Petty coming through the picture, and we go back even further. There's Chad Little and uh, Ken Schrader, but here is an excellent battle. And that's Rusty Wallace moving to the inside of Dale Earnhardt going into turn number nine, and Rusty Wallace is moving up quickly, and we have him running in sixth spot. Wallace in number 27 is sixth. He Look just simply drove deeper into the turn than Earnhardt, which is very unusual. Maybe Earnhardt uh, didn't put up much resistance there. And the two cars right ahead of him are battling for position. Chad Little, who was in the lead when the green flag came out from our uh, red flag, and Ken Schrader is also right ahead of Rusty Wallace. But Wallace is putting on a great demonstration of how, how much he loves to drive on the road courses. We go pit side once again. Bob Jenkins, during the red flag situation, I got a chance to talk with Rusty Wallace, and I asked him, who was the strongest car in the speedway? He said, it's me. We are so tough. In eight and nine, I just can't believe it. Very importantly, this is the same automobile that won Watkins Glen last year. You saw that on ESPN. He dominated the race. He also has won here at Riverside. That car has been raced twice. It has won both times. These guys put a lot of extra effort into road racing, and Rusty Wallace says he is going to come home a winner today. By the looks of his performance on the speedway, it's a pretty good predictor. Rusty Wallace's win here at Riverside came just last November in the Winston Western 500. And now you can see Ken Schrader beginning to challenge Little. Meanwhile, here comes Wallace to the inside of Ken Schrader in corner number nine, making it a three-way race. See what happens as they come out of the corner. Rusty tucks to the inside. Chad Little a little sideways, and so is Ken Schrader. But Rusty picks up two positions. Boy, he just drove on down to the inside of that turn. He's, when he said he was strong in turn nine, he was right. That car stuck right down on the inside. The others had no alternative but just to fight it out there on the outside. And we saw Dale Earnhardt there also pass Chad Little. So Rusty Wallace is definitely a man on the move as he comes up through the S's once again. And that car ahead of him is Jocko Giacomo, who is eight laps down. So is not a those battling for these positions. Also on the move, Bob, is Ricky Rudd, who's leading this race. He's moved out to a better than a six-second lead over Terry Labonte, who is running second. Ken Schrader and Dale Earnhardt now are nose to tail out there on the racetrack. So once again, the cars come down the backstretch with Rusty Wallace leading this group of cars down here. It's Ken Schrader and then Dale Earnhardt going by. Chad Little was the big loser in that skirmish coming off of turn nine. He dropped about four positions. Well, 
There's Phil Parsons, who also is moving toward the front, going to the outside at the entrance of corner number nine and passing Chad Little. And Phil's been picking off one or two cars a lap. He's moving right on up through the field. Good shape. The last time around, we saw Benny Parsons, his brother, just behind Chad Little. And uh, he moved around him on that lap and then passed Chad this lap. So Phil is moving good. Phil Parsons, Chad Little, and Benny Parsons up through the S's here at Riverside. 43 laps have been completed, and the leader is turning laps right around 113 and a half miles an hour. And there is the leader, the number 26 Quaker State Buick, driven by Ricky Rudd. Back with more after these messages. One of the problems with shifting gears on a road course, well, you miss a gear, you over rev the engine, and boom, you're gone, you're history. Well, to prevent that, the crews have installed rev limiters in the car. Now, rev limiter is an electronic piece of equipment, this box here, in line with the car's ignition that is attached to an electronic crystal here that limits the amount of RPMs the engine can turn. Now this crystal here in Ricky Rudd's car allows the engine to turn 8,200 RPMs and he will use that one most of the day in this race. With a few laps to go, Rudd will flip a switch on the dash enacting this crystal which allows the engine to turn almost 9,000 RPMs. Now that'll get a lot more horsepower and really abuse the motor those final few laps. Rev limbers to save it all afternoon, and this other crystal here in the rev limber to let it all out with a few laps to go. And of course, the car we use there in the demonstration of the rev limiter, the Quaker State Buick being driven by Ricky Rudd, who began the race from pole position and now has the lead. As in second position, we have Terry Labonte in car number 11, followed by Sterling Marlin in 44, Kyle Petty in car 21, and Rusty Wallace in number 27, with 45 out of the 95 laps completed. We're inside the car of Dale Jarrett. Who's following Neil Bonnet in car number 75. Bonnet just passed Jarrett on the last lap. And uh, Bonnet would be in 11th position, and Dale uh, would be in 12th. And Hardy's you see the long back stretches the head down through there, go under the Bosch Bridge. This is the fastest point on the racetrack. He's probably about running about 170 miles an hour, maybe 175 as to get into that point. You see him shift down into third turn, third gear as he goes into turn nine, dips down to the inside. You see Bonnie's car drift out just a little bit. Dale gets right down on the white line as he comes around there. That seems to be the best way around and heads off the turn nine up to the start finish line. That turn number nine, Ned, it looks like such a long sweeping turn, but it see also on the other hand, seems like you're in that thing forever. Well, you are in it for a long time. Uh, however, it'll come up pretty quickly on you because you get into it very fast and you have to get off of it very fast as well. As we've heard a number of drivers already say that uh, that's one point on the racetrack that you can either lose a lot of time or make up a lot of time. We're looking back at the Richard Petty STP Pontiac and Richard is in 13th position, but now you can see him closing in on Dale Jarrett. You can see Richard's car bounce as he got just a, one of his wheels off of the track a little bit as he went through one of the S turns. That's Darrell Waltrip following uh, Richard Petty. And behind uh, Waltrip could be the number six car of Mark Martin. Anyway, they're down the backstretch once again. Bob, we mentioned at Talladega that Dale Jarrett, uh, you know, he doesn't drive all the races for Cale Yarborough. There are six remaining that he'll drive for someone else. And it looks like that he will be back in a Hoss Ellington car at the Michigan race. Thanks to Raven Boats and Porta Lube and panel sweatshirts and Bud Light and Coats and Clark and a lot of sponsors putting together a deal as Dale now tries to move on the inside of Chad Little off of turn nine. Five cars nose to tail through corner number nine, and that's Chad Little dropping to the inside and making a pit stop. Now, Dale Earnhardt has already made a pit stop just in the last few laps while we were in commercial. Dale Earnhardt made a stop and so is trying to catch back up with the rest of the field. He made a stop for four tires, Bob, which uh, it was an unscheduled pit stop. And also Bill Elliott, who for a while was back in the lead lap at about the same time that Earnhardt pitted, Bill Elliott came in as well for a change of tires. We're still watching Richard Petty behind Dale Jarrett as they scramble up through the S's into turn six. Darrell Waltrip right behind Richard Petty. 
who was off the track earlier, did quite a bit of sheet metal damage to his tied Chevrolet, but he's running in 13th position and, of course, is on the lead lap. And right behind Darrell Walter is Bobby Allison in car number 12, and a little bit earlier, those two had a meeting out there on the racetrack and ran into each other and slid off the track, and now they're running a nose to tail out there once again. The leader is coming into the pits, Ricky Rudd, in car number 26 is coming into the pits, and Rusty Wallace has just moved around the car number 44. And let's go to the pits and Jerry Punch. Now, well, Ricky Rudd coming in. This is a scheduled pit stop for the Quaker State Buick. The reason being is they saw the pit stop that Earnhardt and Elliott did a few laps ago. Now, both Earnhardt and Elliott had punch tires. They wanted to bring Ricky Rudd down pit road to put some fresh outside tires on the car. Rudd down pit road in 14 and 210 seconds, fresh Goodyear tires. So a good stop for Ricky Rudd, and he goes back out onto the racetrack. But without question, the story to this point in the race has to be Rusty Wallace, who is leading. And there he is, as he has uh, come on to uh, now run in second spot. Yes, Terry Labonte is the leader of the race, but just moments ago, and he's gaining on Terry Labonte, just moments ago, Rusty Wallace moved around the car number 44 of Sterling Marlin, and he is definitely picking up on the car number 11, but the caution is on the racetrack. Well, this will certainly be a break for Labonte, Wallace, and Marlin, who need a pit stop and will be able to get it under a yellow flag condition, whereas Dale Earnhardt and Ricky Rudd have already made their stops. It isn't certainly as much of a factor because of the fact we're running on a road course, but on lap number 49, the yellow comes out for the fifth time, and it's because of some oil in turn number eight. And here comes Terry Labonte in for the stop in the Junior Johnson Budweiser Chevrolet. His is the first pit coming in, and the Crew goes to work on that car. Meanwhile, Rusty Wallace is pitted at almost the uh, opposite end of the uh, pit area. And let's go to Dick Bergren as we see Labonte on the top and Wallace on the bottom. Service being made. Well, Bob, this pit of Terry Labonte had been timing Dale Earnhardt just before this stop to see how much faster he got on new tires. And they were considering putting on new ones, but he's going to get a chance to do it right now. Up pit road with a 27 is Jerry Punch. Jerry? Well, a super pit stop by Jimmy May, Clark, Barry Dotson, and the crew. 13 and 8, 10 seconds under yellow for tire change on the left side. They came around another 12 and a half seconds on the right side, so about 25 seconds for a super pit stop. Darrell Waltrip is in the pits, likewise Sterling Marlin. Everyone on pit road for four fresh tires and a tough break for Ricky Rudd, who was leading, and one more lap. Rudd could have come in under yellow, but here's the tide car being worked on. One crewman inside the car, jacking the weight around, changing the wedge. And puts it back in gear and moves away. A very busy pit road, but everybody moving back out onto the racetrack now. Some are still in. Lake Speed pulling back out onto the race course as we watch Darrell Waltrip and uh, one of the Miller cars, Bobby and Allison. There is uh, Terry Labonte in car number 11. May have gotten out first? No, he did not. Okay. Uh, Rusty Wallace got out first. Uh, car number 11 is trying to catch up to the field, the car that he came out behind. And coming behind uh, Terry Labonte is Dale Earnhardt. We are under caution because of oil on the racetrack up in turn number eight. There's the pace car leading the field into quarter number nine. Our Napa mid-race recap at the halfway point, Ricky Rudd was in the lead, had led 22 of the 48 laps at an average speed of 82.001, and he had pitted on lap six and on lap number 23. We've had four cautions at that time, 17 laps, five leaders, eight lead changes, 43 cars started, 37 remain, and 28 of those 37 are on the lead lap. Out of the race, Jimmy Means in car 52, Morgan Shepard in 33, and Brett Bodine in car number 15. And also out of the race are Ruben Garcia, Alan Kowicki, and Jeff Bodine. Ruben Garcia out of the race, of course, because of that crash out of corner number nine that caused a red flag while track crewmen made repairs to the racetrack. First car behind the pace car is the 66 car of John Krebs, but the leader of the race is Rusty Wallace in car number 27. We'll be right back with more of the Budweiser 400.
Bob Jenkins, Ned Jarrett, Dick Bergman, and Jerry Punch back at Riverside International Raceway for the swan song as far as Winston Cup competition on this racetrack is concerned. Riverside International will host a couple of more races in July, and then it will be completely torn down to make room for a business complex and some housing. So a sad day for many in Southern California. Another racing facility goes by the wayside, of course, Ontario Motor Speedway which was not too far from here, closed down several years ago, and now Riverside comes to an end in 1988. At the Budweiser 400, the leader is Rusty Wallace, and there was a car between Wallace and the pace car. That was John Krebs, but he has come in for a pit stop, and so Wallace is the leader. Second place is Terry Labonte, followed by Dale Earnhardt, Sterling Marlin, Kyle Petty, Chad Little is running in sixth, then Ken Schrader, Ricky Rudd, Phil Parsons, and Benny Parsons. Those are the top 10 with 51 out of 95 laps completed. We're yellow because of oil on the racetrack in turn number eight. However, we're about to go back green. And Bob, they'll have to make at least one more pit stop for fuel, if nothing else, before this race is over. So there will be at least one more pit stop. So the green comes back out on the back stretch as the pace car drops to the inside and the green flag is displayed. And now we'll watch Ricky Rudd battle alongside Ken Schrader down the back stretch as Rudd will begin his move back up toward the front of the pack. He made a pit stop just before the caution came out and then made one during the caution period. So he's got four fresh tires as do many of the cars. And here now is Ken Schrader to the inside being passed by another car on the outside as they come off of corner number nine. That is Phil Parsons in car number 55. And Ricky Rudd moves around Chad Little. One more car out of the way as he makes his way up through there. Boy, you can see how well that car is working through the S's and he does a great job of driving. He's so smooth. He doesn't throw the car around. You can see he just just sort of weaves with the car and, and keeps it uh, all four wheels on the ground. Here's the car number 18 being driven by Elliot Forbes Robinson in the pits now for an unscheduled pit stop for a change of left side tires. That was the car that was started by Rick Hendrick, but he relinquished it to Elliot Forbes Robinson in the early going. And EFR is now getting a four tire change on pit road. And here is Rudd, meanwhile, now right behind Kyle Petty and Sterling Marlin and Dale Earnhardt. And it would appear to me at this moment in the race, Ned, that the two strongest cars on the racetrack, although many of these are certainly capable of winning this race, but Rusty Wallace and Ricky Rudd have been, in my opinion, the strongest here just past the halfway mark. I don't think there's any question about it. Rudd was eighth on the restart. He's now has moved up to fifth position and is gaining on the leaders. And I'll tell you, it's not that easy to pass on this racetrack. And you can see him moving up on Kyle Petty, Sterling Marlin just in front of Kyle Petty. He is a very fast driver right now. Kyle Petty, the number 21 car ahead of uh, Ricky Rudd. That's, of course, the Wood Brothers car. They have eight wins here at Riverside, including five in a row from 1964 through 1969. But they have not won here at Riverside since 1977 when David Pearson did it. Kyle Petty now putting the pressure on Sterling Marlin and Rudd just waiting for either of them to make a mistake. There's Dale Earnhardt right in front of them. So the second through fifth place cars are very close together. And we're still waiting to see Ricky Rudd's move on Kyle Petty. He has not been able to pass Kyle so far. Perhaps as they come down the backstretch here, Rudd will win the race. But for the moment, Rudd appears content to sit behind Kyle Petty and watch things ahead. He maybe can't do anything else. He might just because uh, Kyle's car is very strong as well, and especially down the back stretch. Terry Labonte in car number 11 runs second to Rusty Wallace. Then comes Dale Earnhardt, Sterling Marlin, and now Ricky Rudd does pass Kyle Petty as they go into turn number nine. And that pass was for the fifth position. I thought Rudd was already in fifth position, but he moved into the number five position. Rusty Wallace leads. Terry Labonte is second. Dale Earnhardt is third. Sterling Marlin fourth, and now Ricky Rudd in fifth position. And Kyle Petty back to sixth spot. Well, here's our latest pit stop summary report. Dale Earnhardt went in in 24th position, came out third. Rudd was in the lead when he went in and came out in eighth. 
Labonte stayed the same in second. Marlin went in third, came out fourth, and Rusty Wallace made a gain as he came in in fourth position and came out the leader. Sterling Marlin, car number 44, followed by Ricky Rudd in 26. It was one way that, that Dale Earnhardt gained as much. He, of course, had made a green flag pit stop, and he only changed two tires when he came in the last time during the caution period. A couple of other cars have gone behind the wall as we watch the action on uh, the uh, track. Number 62, driven by Terry Petrus, has gone behind the wall, and so has Rick McRae in car 08. And for a while, the 04 car of Herschel McGriff was behind the wall, but he has since come back out onto the racetrack. Well, he's on the end of the pits now with the hood up. He has come back out into the racing area. The car number 27, uh, Rusty Wallace, the last time around, uh, turned a lap speed of 115 and a half miles an hour. And I'll tell you, at this stage of the race, that is really getting around here. Quite a pace being set by Rusty Wallace, who leads Terry Labonte in the Budweiser 400. We'll be back with more of our live coverage in just a moment from Riverside, California. Rudd has moved to fourth position, passing Sterling Marlin coming out of corner number nine. And here is Daryl Waltrip back into the pit area, and Jerry Punch is right there. An unscheduled stop for Daryl Waltrip in the tied Chevrolet. He had a tire going down, and now Jeff Hamlin, Eddie Dixon, and the crew put right side tires on. Great pit stop, 12 and 9 10 seconds for the tied crew. Waltrip on his way. Battered race car of Daryl Waltrip goes back out there. He was in 10th position when he came in for that unscheduled stop. And Jeff Bodine, as Walter was going out of the pits, also was getting the Levi Garrett Chevrolet as we see him going back out of the action. Of course, Jeff is many laps down now. Bodine, with a big puff of smoke from that car earlier, brought it in. And when we talked to him, he simply didn't know what was wrong. But apparently, the Levi Garrett crew has it repaired. And look at Rudd moving up. He's now in third position as he's been able to pass Dale Earnhardt. So Rudd is third, Earnhardt fourth, and Sterling Marlin fifth. Terry Labonte is running second, and the leader remains Rusty Wallace. Well, Ricky Rudd has just picked him off one at a time. He was eighth on this restart, Bob, and now has gotten himself up to third position. Only has two more cars to get back to the front. He's almost seven seconds behind Rusty Wallace. In fact, six and nine-tenths of a second behind Rusty Wallace now that he's gotten into third. We'll keep an eye on him and see if he's able to gain on him. The crew would very much like to have a win. They have finished in second position twice this year as Chad Little also comes in for a stop in the Coors sponsored machine. Ricky Rudd has finished second at Richmond. He's finished second at North Wilkesboro, but not a win so far for this team in Winston Cup competition. This seems to be Ricky's best shot at a win, certainly all year long. And I think he felt coming here that it would be his best shot. Even though he was injured at Charlotte, it was questionable whether he would be able to change gears and do all that thing because his leg was injured, but he says it's really easier on him here than it was on the oval tracks because he breaks with his right foot here. On the oval tracks, he breaks with his left foot. You can see some hand gesturing there by Dale Earnhardt as he signaled to Sterling Marlin, perhaps signaling him to go ahead and make a pass because Dale Earnhardt, or rather, yeah, Dale Earnhardt loses another position and Dale, while he had handling problems last week at Dover that kept him out of competition, is uh, not doing too badly, but is losing position as Jeff Bodine goes behind the wall again. Well, he had big smoke coming out of the car as he came across the start-finish line, and Rusty Wallace was coming up on him, but Jeff did get the car out of the racing surface, and you can see now he has pulled out at the end of pit road, and he's backing down pit road rather than go all the way around the racetrack. So perhaps... Jeff Bodine is out of the competition after trying it again, but the car just not working for him. So Rusty Wallace in car number 27 leads the Budweiser 400, and we have completed 58 of the 95 laps. We'll be back with more right after this. Budweiser 400 being led by Ricky Ru rather by Rusty Wallace at the moment as here he is approaching some of the slower traffic passing uh, Davey Allison whose car was damaged in a crash early in the race and now the car right ahead of Rusty is the uh, number 19 car driven by Chad Little which was in the lead 
earlier in the race. Second place belongs to Terry Labonte. In third place is uh, Ricky Rudd for Sterling Marlin. And now the number 21 car of Kyle Petty moves to fifth as he battles with Dale Earnhardt. And Dale is coming in for a pit stop. And this would be an unscheduled pit stop for Dale Earnhardt. And Jerry Punch is there in his pits. No, he's going right on by. No, he is no, he's he's at the end of the pit road, so Jerry Punch is right there to call the pit stop. Well, another unscheduled stop for Dale Earnhardt. He has a cracked windshield, a small crack in the windshield, but that's not what they're concerned about now. Again, probably a cut tire for Earnhardt. He, left side tires come off the Goodrich Chevrolet. They chase one tire down. Now they put the left side tires on Earnhardt back in gear, and he's down in the way. What a tough break for Earnhardt. Chad Little just come in a couple laps ago with the same problem. He had a cut right rear tire, so a lot of tires being cut down by gravel here on this road course. Well, Bob, that's one thing that we talked about at the top of the show that you'd see if there were tire problems today. It would be from cut tires as opposed to the blistering and the heat problems that we've seen at Charlotte and at Dover last week. Well, Hoosier tires certainly not represented at this race as they have been on some of the uh, oval track races earlier in the year. Of course, Hoosier had never been to uh, Riverside International Raceway, so they're, uh, and look at this, Daryl Waltrip has made contact with something again. He is limping toward fr uh, pit road, and the left front of that car has been mangled. I believe he, that he must have blown a tire or something, and, uh, and the tire just coming apart has torn more sheet metal away. Let's go to Jerry Punch. That's exactly what happened, Dan. Apparently, he cut a tire also. There's a lot of gravel and debris being kicked up on the road course, so they go through the S's, and apparently, Walter, who is so disgusted, just throws a cup of water out of the window. What a tough break. What else could happen to the tight crew? The left front of the car is severely mangled. Jeff Hammond and Teddy Jones, they're working on the car, and Hammond talking to Walter, just cut it off. We've got a lot of work to do here, and Darrell Walter has won five times here at Riverside. Will not get win number six today. A lengthy pit stop. They've got a lot of work to repair the left front of his Chevrolet. How frustrating it must be for Waltrip. He has had numerous assorted problems that have kept him out of competition, and now they work feverishly to get him back into the race. There you can see that Ricky Rudd has caught Terry Labonte, and we may have a change of second position here momentarily. Rudd doing a fine job moving up through the field from that pit stop, and now he runs right behind Terry Labonte on the racetrack down the back stretch, battling for that second spot. There is Sterling Marlin right behind, who is in fourth. Well, Bob, a moment ago, when Rudd got into third place, he was about six and nine tenths seconds behind the leader, Rusty Wallace. He now is about seven and nine tenths seconds, so he has lost a second, but he's had to battle some cars up through there, and now he's got to battle Terry Labonte. He'll be a little tougher to pass than some of those he has passed earlier. They come through the main front stretch here, across the start finish line. And now head up through the S's. This is not the place that you will probably see a pass. The body leading Rudd up through the S's. The leader, meanwhile, Rusty Wallace, is having difficulty passing a back marker. And in the meantime, these guys are closing in on the leader. Well, that back marker is uh, Chad Little, who had made an unscheduled pit stop. So Chad's running very strong. He's still on the lead lap. He's running in 23rd position. That means there are 23 cars in the lead lap, but he is about to go a lap down and is fighting Rusty Wallace to try to stay in the lead lap as we see this fight for second place. Now we'll see what Rudd does as they come down the back stretch. This is the place to pass if Rusty Ricky can do it. We saw the yellow number four car of Rick Wilson also racetrack. He is many laps down, having had transmission problems earlier in the race. Nope, Rudd still can't get the job done. Well, maybe so. Going into turn nine, he's going to drive hard in there, but Labonte goes a little bit high. Here comes Rudd down on the inside. Can he make the pass? Coming out of corner number nine, Rudd is to the inside, and Labonte outside. Here they come. Rudd, I believe, is going to have second position. Terry Labonte, though, battles back. And they're side by side at the start finish line. Somebody's going to have to give here as they head toward the S's. There's only room for one lane, and Ricky Rudd has second spike. Well, that was a neat pass. He just drove deep into turn nine. Labonte went deep, too, but he went a little high as he went into the turn, and Rudd was able to move underneath him. If it had been a, the last lap at the start finish line, it would have been a photo finish for that second place. But as they went into the S's, Rudd was able to take it up. 
We have 32 laps remaining in this race, and the situation is Rusty Wallace, the leader, and now Ricky Rudd is in second position. Those two cars definitely the strongest in the first two-thirds of the race. Terry Labonte runs in third. Sterling Marlin has four spot at the moment, and in fifth is Kyle Petty. Sixth is Phil Parsons. Seventh, Neil Bonnet. Eighth is Richard Petty. Ninth is Benny Parsons, and in tenth, is Mark Martin. And while that battle was going on for second, Rusty Wallace was able to move around Chad Little and put him a lap down. And since then, he has moved around Elliot Forbes Robinson, who is, is substituting for Rick Hendrick and put him a lap down. So now we have 21 cars in the lead lap. And a couple of others have gone behind the wall or to their garage area, including the 79 car of Roy Smith. They've taken the 31 car of Joe Rutman just behind the pit wall to work on it. So Joe may be back in competition soon, but at the moment, those two cars are out of competition. So Rusty Wallace leads with Ricky Rudd second and Terry Labonte third. 64 laps completed at Riverside International Raceway. Back in just a moment. Back at Riverside International Raceway where Rusty Wallace leads Ricky Rudd and Terry Labonte in the Budweiser 400. Let's go to Dr. Jerry Punch. Well, let's take a look and show you what happened to Darrell Waltrip. Now, coming down the back stretch at about 180 or 85 miles an hour, the fastest part of this road course, he was gearing down to go into turn nine, and boom, he cut this left front tire. And I mean, he cut it in a big way. Take a look. This is the inner liner of the tire. It has shattered it. It exploded as well. It cut the tire apart. It completely shredded the tire. And this shredding of the tire at 180 miles an hour tore the left front fender and some of the suspension and chassis parts apart from the car. So they are trying to repair the car behind me. But you see what happens to the tire. Not much left. Not a problem with a Goodyear tire. Merely a cut from debris here on the track in turn nine. Let's go up pit road to Dick Berger. Dick. Well, Jerry, virtually every race we've been doing this year, tires have been a story, a major story, and the big part of that story has been whether it's been Goodyear or Hoosier that's been fastest. And that's not the story here at all. It appears as if the tires are almost equal. If anything, Goodyear may have a slight edge. For sure, Goodyear is on more cars than anybody else's tires. So Goodyear has perhaps a better chance to do things. We've seen no blisters. We've seen no problems with wear at all. By the way, I'm in Terry Lavani's pit. Just before we started this little piece, went over to his crew chief, and I said, you guys are drifting back. What's the problem? Tim Brewer just looked at me in a discouraged way and said, very simply, we're getting beat. Yeah, I think it's more of uh, guys moving up than uh, Terry Lavani moving back. In any case, Bobby Hillen Jr. has gotten off course, and made some spins throughout the dust but now is back out on the racetrack Bobby Hill and Jr. in car number eight. There is the leader Rusty Wallace car number 27. Well that car is working well he's uh, staying about eight seconds ahead of Ricky Rudd. As we told you earlier, these cars will need at least one more pit stop before the end of the race, and that could be a very crucial pit stop if we stay green the rest of the way. Yeah, it would be interesting to see what they would do, Bob. Most of them, I suspect, would take on left side tires and, of course, fill them up with gasoline. Now, this is one racetrack that you do not want to stretch your fuel mileage because if you run out of gas anywhere other than coming off of turn nine, you're in deep trouble. You are in deep trouble indeed. Now, if the race were to end right now with Rusty Wallace in the lead, Dale Earnhardt is in 16th position. Wallace would take over the Winston Cup points lead. That's if the race were to end right now, but we've still got several more laps to go before this one is over. Can Rusty Wallace continue his lead? We'll be back with more of our live coverage right after this. Here are the top 10 at the end of 67 laps. Rusty Wallace leads Ricky Rudd second, Terry Labonte third, Sterling Marlin fourth, fifth is Kyle Petty. In sixth, Neil Bonnet seventh, Phil Parsons eighth is Richard Petty, ninth is Benny Parsons, and tenth is Dale Jarrett. Just a few minutes ago, as we watch uh, Rusty Wallace negotiate this track, he now has about a nine and a half second lead on Ricky Rudd. A few minutes ago, we had another off course excursion, this one by Bobby Hillen Jr. Bobby going through the S's. It looks like he just got a little hard in there. The right rear tire got off on the dirt, and around he went. 
in front of the car number 63 of Jocko Majacomo. And boy, he did a good job of maneuvering around Bobby Hill. And as Bobby comes back across the track, gets on the dirt, he'll finally get it straightened out and get back out on the race course and get going again. Nice job by Jocko Majacomo in missing that spinning Bobby Hillen car. Rusty Wallace, the Kodiak Pontiac, leading this Budweiser 400. And we go inside the Superflow Motor Oil sponsored car, now being driven by Elliot Forbes Robinson, started by Rick Hendrick, the owner of the car. Of course, Elliot Forbes Robinson is another very good road racer. He's won a lot of road, road races in uh, various types of competition. He looked to be sliding around corner number eight up there. There he is. Uh, his position is 21st on the field. He just went a lap down not too long ago. He made an unscheduled pit stop. And here is uh, Terry Labonte moving around Chad Little. We saw Ricky Rudd pass him there just a moment ago. Rudd hasn't been able to move too far away from Terry Labonte once he got around him. You're absolutely right, Ned. That's one of the things that has surprised me here in the last few laps. I thought that when Rudd passed Terry Labonte, he would just pull away. But as you can see, they're separated by only actually just a few car lengths. Not too, too much. And they'll be making pit stops in the next eight or ten laps. In fact, right now, Sterling Marlin is coming into the pits in the car number 44. He was running in the fourth position. We'll see what they do to that car. This should be his last pit stop of the day. Jake Elder, the crew chief of the Piedmont Airlines Oldsmobile, and they are going to the left side. I sort of suspected that they would change left side tires. They'll look at the right side tires. They'll fill it up with Unical gasoline. Be sure to get enough in it to go to the rest of the way. And that's what they're waiting on now is just to get the rest of the gas in. No, they're going around. They're going to change all four tires on that car. That's a little surprising. So Sterling is going to be set up here for the rest of the race with four new tires and a complete load of fuel. Still working on the right side, getting the rubber on it. Now he's away. And Sterling is among the first of those running up front to come in for a final pit stop. And we now move inside Dale Jarrett's car, the Hardy's Oldsmobile. He's running behind Lake Speed. Lake is a couple of laps down as a result of some problems earlier when he was in the garage area. Dale now up in the ninth position after Sterling Marlin made his pit stop. That right there is not considered a turn here. It's not numbered as such, but it certainly uh, gives the drivers something to look for as they set up for turn number nine. And you can see one of the cars get down on the dirt as he went into the turn. That would have been Benny Parsons in car number 90 as Benny is trying to move around the car number 12 of Bobby Allison. And Benny's, there's Allison a couple laps down. Benny's doing a fine job. There you can see Dale passing uh, Davey Allison, who has not been competitive since uh, having an encounter earlier. Look how close Mark <laughs> Martin comes to the rear end of Dale Jarrett's car. Boy, he just moved up on him in a hurry. Dale had to back off when he when he ran up on Davey Allison. There was a couple of cars there that was uh, almost blocking the track. They got out of the way, but Mark just moved right up on his back bumper in a hurry. They've been having a pretty good battle. Mark ran in front of Dale for a while, and oh. Dale got around him now. Mark's trying to get back around him, but Jarrett just closed the door on him. Boy, they, I think they hit. But anyway, Dale holds him off for the moment. Mark Martin drops back just a little bit. Now he'll close the gap as they head for turn number eight. That's where Dale Jarrett is right now. And look at Martin get the rear end of that car out a little bit. Now they'll come off corner number eight and head down the long back stretch. Well, Jarrett gained quite a bit of time in there when they had that little encounter. I guess Martin had to back off for a little bit. Now he's coming up on the back bumper of Bobby Allison and moving on the inside of him as they go down the back stretch. So Dale Jarrett having a good run. So are several others that are showing up in the top ten, including Benny Parsons, who is in eighth position. Richard Petty shown in seventh at the moment. A nice run for him. And Mark Martin is in sixth place. And certainly we can't forget about Neil Bonnet, who qualified well and is in fourth position. Neil Bonnet is fourth on the field. He has run a good hard race all day long. Jarrett moving through the gears. Now, he's one of the drivers that's not changing gears as many times, Bob. He's only changing seven times a lap. He does not have one of the transmissions that they go down into first gear. A number, about a half a dozen of the cars have a transmission, so the gearing 
is that they go into first gear uh, off of turn six. That gives them a little better jump as they come off of that turn. Rusty Wallace is one of those drivers that does have that transmission in the car. We're anticipating a pit stop by Rusty Wallace here. He has radioed the crew that he is ready to make his final pit stop. And indeed, here he comes moving through that chicane that we talked about earlier. And Dr. Jerry Punch is there to call Rusty Wallace's pit stop. Final scheduled stop for the Kodiak Pontiac, and Harold Elliott will bring that car to a halt. Mary Dotson, Jimmy May Carr, and the crew are going to work on the left side of the car. Now they will pay, put four tires on the car, four fresh Goodyear tires. They last pitted on lap 50. We are showing lap 74 right now. They can go the rest of the way on fuel. The crew rushing around to the right side. Dotson has the jack beneath the car. Jimmy May Carr takes the right front tire off. They roll a fresh tire, right front and right rear. Pop fuel off of the car. Norman, Coach of Issue, the gas man, down to the lane. 23 and 8 10 seconds. Good stop for the Kodiak crew. And so Rusty Wallace is now set up for the finish of the race. There are a couple of other drivers that have been also for pit stops. Dale Jarrett's crew working on that car. You can see the fuel going in. And they're also changing tires on the left side of the Hardy's Oldsmobile. Now the second can of gas goes in. And they need to put all the fuel in they can. They're going to go around and uh, let's see if they're going to change right side tires as well. They are. So everybody looks like is going to go ahead and change four tires. And I thought that they might only change left side tires, Bob, but everyone we have seen so far have changed all four. And I guess it's a precautionary measure for one thing, because you never know when you might have run over something and cut something, cut a tire, but also the right side tires take a pretty good beating on this racetrack. And if you have four tires, four fresh tires, you can run much faster than if you just have two. And here now is the leader of the race, Ricky Rudd. However, he will need a pit stop in the next few laps. So we're set up for an exciting conclusion to this final Winston Cup race at Riverside International Raceway. At the moment, Rudd leads the Budweiser 400. The Junior Johnson prepared Budweiser Chevrolet driven by Terry Labonte is on pit road for his final stop. He was running in second position when he came in. The lead is still in the hands of Ricky Rudd. However, we've been told that he too will make his final pit stop possibly this next time around. There's Rudd on the racetrack running with Bobby Hill and Junior. Richard Petty is in the pit. So is uh, Mark Martin. Kenny Schrader has just come into the pits. These are all scheduled pit stops. We knew that they were coming up. They had to make one more pit stop, and those are happening right now. And here comes Rudd approaching turn number nine. And if he's going to make a pit stop, he'll be slowing the car down momentarily and dropping to the inside of the racetrack to come in through the chicane. And that's something that's worked very well on pit road today is the cars have had to reduce their speed dramatically to get through this chicane and into the pit area. Here comes Rudd for the final stop. And Dick Bergren is in Ricky Rudd's pits to call the stop. Dick? Bob, they really wanted to do this under a caution flag and change four tires, but now they're going to have to do it under a green flag. And everybody in this pit has had four fingers up in the air. They are planning to change four tires. If they had to change under green, they originally wanted to change only two, the left side. But they've been watching up and down pit road, and every single competitive team has changed four. That has caused these guys to decide they, too, are going to change four tires. This is the most crucial pit stop of the entire day for this team. If they can get it done, get it done well, get it done fast. If the tires they pick are right, Rudd has a chance to win. If not, all this effort goes for waste. Rudd, now, now, away he goes. But while he was in the pits, Rusty Wallace went by and is way out in front of him. So he has a lot of catching up to do. Rudd moves back out into the racetrack, trying to build up to speed. There is uh, the number 75 car of Neil Bonnet, who is now leading this race. But he has not yet stopped for the final time, and he will be coming in momentarily. But Neil Bonnet is in the lead at the present. Rusty Wallace, when Neil Bonnet comes in for the final stop, will be the leader. Let's see if Neil comes in this time. There is Wallace just now approaching corner number nine. And Neil Bonnet stays out there, so he's going to lead at least one more lap. Well, let's hope he doesn't stretch it too far because he certainly does not want to run out of gas. Of course, I'm sure that Butch Mock and Bob Rahimi, the car owner, 
drivers of the Valvoline Pontiac number 75 have calculated their fuel mileage very well and know how he stands. Such a great early part of the season for Neil Bonnet, a fourth at Daytona, then he won two in a row and went into the lead in Winston Cup points, but since then it has not been a necessarily good season for Neil Bonnet. This is one of his uh, better performances in the last uh, five or six races. Bill Elliott comes in for another stop. It's been an uphill struggle all day for the Coors Motorcraft team. He comes in for his final stop of the afternoon. Just behind him on pit road is Bobby Hillen, as we see Neil Bonnet now coming down the back stretch, and we'll see if he's going to come into the pits. That's Chad Little right ahead of Neil Bonnet. Valvoline Pontiac moves through corner number nine. Bonnet appears to be slowing down. Let's see what happens here as they come off corner number nine. Yep. Nope, he's staying out there. Staying out there again. That's a little surprising, Bob, because there's on a track like this, it's, there's no advantage to stretching it too far because if you're going to have to stop, you know you can stop without losing a lap. And uh, you take an awfully big risk by staying out there and taking a chance of running out of gas. Because as you mentioned, if you run out of gas anywhere but coming out of corner number nine, you are essentially through for the afternoon. Trying to move around. Chad Little, who has had a good race leading earlier. One of those that um, has certainly ooh, put on a good demonstration for the Winston West competitors. Bonnie got his left uh, tires off of the track there just momentarily. But he kept control and keeps coming. And I believe that would put Chad Little back in the, the lead lap, but he's uh, just about to go a lap down again. had an awfully good pit stop. He was running pretty far behind uh, Terry Levante before he came in the pits. I think Kyle only took on two tires and Terry did take on four. Dave Mark is coming into the pits right now in car number 71. Go! Oh, we have a stop. crash. That's Lake Speed who got uh, off the course and hit the wall and got airborne as a matter of fact, but everything settled down and now the car is half on the racetrack and half off as the others go by, but Lake really hit a uh, hit the wall rather hard on the right side of that car. Yes, he did. Lake was running a couple of laps down as a result of some earlier problems. We have not seen a caution come out because he still is coming around the racetrack, so apparently there was no, no major damage done as far as the, the racing service is concerned. And so here's that battle for third with Kyle Petty and Terry Labonte as they come off the turn nine. Now they're running ahead of Ricky Rudd Rudd was ahead of both of those drivers before they came into the pits, but now he's having to play catch up. Let's take a look at what happened as uh, Lake Speed and Richard Petty were running out there together, and Richard with a little bit of a nudge sending Lake Speed sideways. Yep, just a little bit of a nudge. Boy, he did hit that wall pretty good, climbed up on the wall for a little bit, and then bounced back down into the dirt. But Lake Speed keeps going, and we have no caution on the racetrack, so the competition still is at full speed. There is Terry Labonte in car number 11, and once again, he is uh, in fifth place. Fifth place. We still have not seen Neil Bonnet come onto pit road, and I'm quite surprised at that. But Neil apparently knows how much fuel he has in that car and is staying out as long as he can. There he is, just passing the start-finish line, so uh, no, uh, no pit stop on this lap either. Let's go to Jerry Punch in the bonnet pit. Perhaps he can explain what's going on. Interesting bit of pit strategy possibly taking place here between Butch Mock and Bob Rahilly. They, they watched the Rusty Wallace and Ricky Rudd cars come in both and take on four tires. Now, they are showing nowhere at all in their Goodyear tires. Goodyear's really done their homework here. And so just possibly, Butch Mock won't exactly tell us, just possibly they will come in in about four or five laps at fuel only, and they're going to try to sneak one and win it here at Riverside. Neil Bonnet's never won on a road course. This will be his first victory, and they're hoping the tires will hold up and just put gas in the car and go and try to stay out front. But Jerry, he could not come into the pits and just take gas on and stay ahead of Rusty Wallace because Rusty's only about four or five seconds behind him on the racetrack, so he's going to lose the lead 
when he comes into the pits. I guess the theory is just to build up as much of a lead as possible, but he's really isn't doing that. You can see Rusty Wallace. He's right at the top of your screen there as the cars came down the backstretch. So Rusty is definitely moving in on him, and uh, I'm not so sure about what that is. Uh, not such good thinking on the part of the uh, Raymock team. Well, I don't think it'll help him to win the race. Uh, however, for caution should come out now, he can make his pit stop under caution, but Rusty Wallace has already made his pit stop under green and is about to catch up to Neil Bonnet. Neil Bonnet has won a couple of races here at Riverside in 1980, or rather his second place in 1980 and 84. All right, a battle for third place as Terry Labonte moves on the inside of Dale Earnhardt going into turn nine. There's Kyle Petty running behind them. Earnhardt goes a little high as they come off of that turn. Terry Labonte moves right on around, and here comes Kyle Petty trying to move around Earnhardt as well. It's going to be questionable whether Dale Earnhardt can go the rest of the distance. Remember, he's off sequence as far as pit stops are concerned as Petty moves around him. He made an unscheduled pit stop, and he had about 32, 33 laps to go when he made that pit stop, so it'll run him very close whether he can go the rest of the way on fuel. His stop was much earlier than everybody else, so there is somewhat of a question as to whether he'll have enough to go the distance. Krebs, number 66, Skoll-sponsored car, is ahead of Terry Labonte and Kyle Petty and Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt had stopped on lap 60, and uh, this is a 95-lap race, so actually it's 35 laps. I, I don't think that Dale Earnhardt can make it the rest of the way. I think he will have to stop at least for fuel. So there is Terry Labonte in third position. And we understand that Bonnet is coming in. Here he is. Neil Bonnet makes the stop. Jerry Punch is there. Well, Bonnet brings the Valvoline Pontiac in very quickly and jams on the brakes as we call it. They are not going to put tires on the car. They're going to have fuel only. Butch locked into one gas can there. And the rest of the Valvoline crew ready to push the car off. Now, back in gear, down and away. Well, Jerry, I think, you know, that can be a good strategy. I said it might not win the race for it, but who knows what might happen. But it certainly will pick a lot of pick him up a lot of positions out on the racetrack because everybody else that he was running behind before they made their pit stops did take on at least two tires. Some of them took on four tires. Very good point. So uh, Bonnet makes a very quick pit stop and is certainly in the hunt here as we get down to the final few laps of this race. There's Davey Allison's crippled car moving slowly as the Faster cars pass him. Terry Labonte is in second now. Third is a battle between Kyle Petty and Neil Bonnet. Kyle Petty takes over third. Bonnet is back to fourth. And the yellow flag is out right now. It'll be a full course yellow flag at the start finish line. Well, this is going to bunch up the field and make for some great racing here in the last few laps. The yellow comes out on lap number 82, so we're 13 laps from the finish. And this is going to build the drama toward the end as we've got about six or seven cars that could very well walk off with the last win here at Riverside. We are yellow because Ernie Irvin's car, number two, has stalled on the backstretch. And the track officials are going to have to come and get that car off the racetrack before we go green again. So here comes Terry Labonte, Kyle Petty, Neil Bonnet, Dale Earnhardt, and several others into pit road as the yellow flies over Riverside. We'll be right back. Winston Cup replays are brought to you by Purolator, the first name in filters for Pure Oil now and Pure Oil later. It's Purolator. Riverside, 1963 in the third Winston Cup race here. 1960 Winston Cup champ Rex White found the track tough. And so did Don Knowles. And Bob Bondurant with the race's fastest qualifier, Paul Goldsmith. Marvin Panch and Lorenzen battled throughout the event. Richard Petty was here in his fifth year of driving. Panch finally passed Wet Lorenzen for the lead. Meanwhile, Daryl Derringer was moving up quickly in the 16 Mercury. There were no radios in those days. The crew called you in with a pit board and white rag. Daryl moved on to pit road. And so did Fireball Roberts in another Holman Moody Ford. Daryl got out quickly and assumed command of the race. 
And then when Fireball Roberts spun, Daryl Derringer had his first and only win at Riverside International. Well, Rusty Wallace looks for his second win here at Riverside International Raceway, and uh, we're going to try to contact Rusty here by radio to see how things are going. Rusty, this is Bob Jenkins. You got a copy on us? Well, we hear the public address announcer, but uh, we do not hear Rusty Wallace. We do have uh, radio communication with him, but... Uh, Rusty, this is Bob Jenkins at ESPN. You got a copy on us? Yeah, Bob, I do. Go ahead. Rusty, you didn't make a pit stop. Uh, everything to your suiting. Can you win this race? Well, I can't hardly gamble on making the pit stop. We do. That will be in the back of the line. And that won't win the race. It all depends on Rusty, right? We'll see what happens. I think I can win it. I've been pretty strong all day long. We'll see what happens. Do your tires feel okay, Rusty? Not as good as I like, but they're pretty good. Best of luck. We'll be watching you. Well, I'm sure he needed to see this uh, this caution come out, Bob, because he had a big lead yeah, after Neil Bonnet had come into the pits, uh, even though Neil just took on fuel. At that time, Rusty had a big lead, and he, he hated to see this caution come out, but NASCAR had no choice but to throw the caution because the car was stalled, and that car being Ernie Furman, one of the rookie drivers in the race. 11 more laps to go, make that 10 laps to go. This completes lap number 85, the top 10. Rusty Wallace, Ricky Rudd, Bill Parsons, Terry Labonte, Kyle Petty. Sixth is Dale Earnhardt, seventh is Neil Bonnet, eighth is Benny Parsons, ninth is Sterling Marlin, and 10th position is Mark Martin. We can go a few uh, more positions after that. 11th is Richard Petty, in 12th position, is Bill Schmidt, who's leading the Winston West competitors. 13th is the 29 car of Dale Jarrett, and in 14th position is Michael Waltrip. Those are the 14 cars in the lead lap at this point. Field moving up through the S's now once again, anticipating a uh, green flag possibly this time around. As we believe the lights in the pace car are out indeed, and they'll be getting the green flag on the backstretch. And there will be just a little more than nine laps of racing to go with Rusty Wallace looking for his second consecutive win here at Riverside. He won the race late last year here. The defending champion of this race is Tim Richmond, who of course is not competing in Winston Cup this year. It was good a moment ago on the, on the flashback, Bob, to see Daryl Derringer win. Of course, Daryl uh, suffering from cancer, resting at home in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. We'll say hello to him, and uh, Daryl, congratulations again on that win. A week from today, we'll be at Portland International Raceway, just up the road here, for IndyCar Racing, our first IndyCar telecast of 1988. Green flag is out. We go back to racing, and let's see what happens. Ricky Rudd begins his pursuit of Rusty Wallace. Well, those have been the two strongest cars all day long, and we'll see which one has it now. Pontiac or Buick. These guys started on the front row. Rudd was on the pole with Wallace outside. And now Wallace has the lead, getting the left side of the car off the racetrack just slightly and kicking up a little bit of dust. And look how close Ricky Rudd is. Oh, we have a spin. Ken Schrader is looping, coming off of corner number nine. And Neil Bonnet also spins. Spins actually into the pit area, knocking down some of the pylons. Sterling Marlin also involved. So was uh, Dave Marcus. Both of those cars are still running. Now Neil gets his car headed in the right direction, and everybody escapes, but the yellow flag comes out once again. But these leaders have not gotten the yellow flag yet, so they're going to be racing back to the yellow flag. Of course, their pit crew are telling them on the radio, hey, everything's clear down here, guys. Go on through. Go as hard as you can. So they will race back all the way to the start-finish line because that wreck happened behind them. They're coming out of corner number eight. We'll have to go down the back stretch. And the yellow flag is out. Ricky Rudd make a pass as Rusty Wallace has slowed down. Well, now, have they received the yellow back there, or do they race the, the, to the, the front only, stretch? The only official yellow flag is at the start-finish line. They were told wow. in the driver's meeting, so you can see everybody making passes as they come down through there. Now, a number of the cars behind them have gotten the yellow flag, but apparently Dale Earnhardt did not. 
but uh, they are racing back to the flag and start finish line. So Wallace now is third as both Earnhardt and Phil Parsons passed. Now they come down for the yellow, and Earnhardt is going to be the leader of the race. Phil Parsons second, then Rusty Wallace, Terry Labonte, and Ricky Rudd. And I'm a little bit confused because it appeared to me as if both Wallace and Rudd slowed down there on the backstretch. Because Dale Earnhardt uh, just shot around. Yeah, this is sort of uh, the shades of the of the Grand National yes. race at Dover right. a week ago yesterday. But they were told in the driver's meeting that they, even though there are, are caution flags around the racetrack by various officials, and it is possible that part of the race course could be under caution and everywhere else would be green. But they were told that the official caution flag is only at the start finish line. And so my opinion is that they needed to race back to the start finish line. Rusty Wallace, apparently, once he saw the yellow lights, decided not to do that. Well, we are cautioned because of this little scramble that occurred coming out of corner number nine as watch Ken Schrader's red number 25 car may have been bumped by Terry Labonte. And anyway, it sent Rusty, or rather, uh, Ken Schrader sideways. And right back down into Neil Bonnet, he tapped Neil and knocked him around down on the inside of the track. And then Sterling Marlin came through. I believe Sterling got through there okay. He just came down pit road and Dave Marcus went down into the dirt there as well. And Benny Parsons narrowly escaped being involved in that crash also. Pace car is out on the racetrack, and the yellow is flying once again on Riverside International Raceway. We'll be back with more from Riverside right after this. This race, we are getting an explanation from NASCAR at the moment. We believe that Rusty Wallace and Ricky Rudd will be moved back to the front of the pack because. The pace car had its lights flashing and was trying to get onto the racetrack back there in corner number eight when um, the others, including Dale Earnhardt and Phil Parsons, shot by Rudd and uh, Walla, Wallace. And this, this is how it happened. Here as they came off of turn eight, of course, Ra Wallace was leading the race, and he saw, you saw, see the pace car did have the lights on, and of course they knew the caution was out, so Rusty slowed down, Rudd passed him, and Earnhardt just drove right on past all of them. He was still wide open at that point, and uh, even though the official caution flag is at the start finish line they're saying because the pace car had its caution lights on that that was confusing to the drivers that's why they slowed down and uh, they're going to change them put them back up there now Earnhardt's not going to give that up very easy <laughs> but uh, NASCAR has the call on it so they are going to put Rusty Wallace back in front let's once again try to reach Rusty uh, Wallace to get his feelings on what's going on out there Rusty, this is Bob Jenkins. You read again? Yeah, I got you. Go ahead. What's going on? Well, NASCAR's getting a little confused. They're left cars that are behind. The left cars are behind me. They let Ricky Rudd pass and he's a single file restart. They're not allowed to do that. The pace car pulled out in front of me and Rudd in the middle of back starting, which he wasn't supposed to do that. Now he's got everything all fouled up. This is going to cost me a race, and I'm going to drive my butt off. Let's see what happens. So when you saw the pace car there in the back stretch, you got off the accelerator, right? That's right. The pace car pulled, turned the yellow lights on, and pulled in front of us in the middle of the back straightaway. Me and Rudd both stopped, and Earnhardt took off. It's not right. NASCAR's got a mess up. Well, apparently you and Rudd are being put back in first and second, so they may have uh, this whole thing figured out. So <laughs> that indeed well, we is the that. case that NASCAR yeah. has uh, said that it was uh, the fault of the pace car that yep. came out uh, and it was uh, confusing to the drivers, as Rusty said, when yep. he pulled out there with those lights on, you know, he slowed down, which was a smart thing for him to do. Absolutely. And so, and I commend NASCAR for the stand that they yes. have taken. They made a mistake, mm -hmm. and uh, and now they're rectifying it in this matter. Exactly. They are doing what they should do in uh, making this a fair, a fair race, at least from where I sit. Anyway, pace car remains out on the racetrack, and this is the area that they would be getting the green in, so we'll go at least one more lap before we get the green. And 89 laps are complete right now. They'll come down to complete 90 at this time, and that means there will be less than five laps to go when apparently they will get the green. 
Here's the view from inside of Dale Jarrett's car, who's having a great afternoon. Dale, I believe, is currently running in the 11th position, right behind uh, Bill Smith, who's running in the 10th position. So Dale has had a good run here this afternoon, and Kale Yarbrough is hard as his going to be. Kale sitting at home in uh, Timmonsville, South Carolina, watching his car this afternoon. So while we are under this caution to sort things out, we're going to take another break and be right back for more of the Budweiser 400 from Riverside International Raceway. Field comes out of corner number eight, and the green flag is out. We've got five more laps of racing to go. Who is going to win this race? It's Rusty Wallace now. Ricky Rudd running in second. The battle for third is between Terry Labonte and Phil Parsons. Labonte appears to have third as they head for turn number nine. Phil Parsons back to fourth. Dale Earnhardt is in fifth position. And let's go to Dick Bergeron, who is in the Richard Childress Dale Earnhardt pit. They can't be happy with what just happened. No, they sure are not happy with what just happened. And with Kirk Shelmerdine, who's watching the last turn, turn nine with his glasses, and they take vigorous exception to the decisions that have just been made. Kirk, what do you, what's your view of it? about the pace car moving out on the racetrack on the back stretch while they were racing so they slowed down and they claim no oh, Dale dale's in trouble by the way dick i'm standing here watching dale with the glasses to make sure he doesn't run off in the dirt or anything so we know to be ready that pace car didn't move it stayed in the same place it always been all day long oh man we got some slow down he screwed up we got some great action out there dick i'll tell you dale earnhardt yeah, is just driving the wheels off that car and we've got more action up through the S's. Yellow flag is out in that particular section of the racetrack. I don't know whether it's going to be an overall caution. Apparently not. We don't see Harold Kender below us with the yellow, but certainly there is a lot of dust up there and uh, up there in the S's. Meanwhile, it is Rusty Wallace leading Terry Labonte, Ricky Rudd, Dale Earnhardt, uh, Phil Parsons and Benny Parsons. Terry Labonte was able to get around Ricky Rudd and has moved away from him, and he might be moving in on Rusty Wallace a little bit, Bob. He is really moving that Budweiser Chevrolet. There are three laps to go. That completes lap number 92. There you can see some damage to the left side of the Ricky Rudd car. Meanwhile, Kyle Petty in car number 21, who is running in the top 10, is coming toward the pit. Well, there he is. The Wood Brothers Ford being brought in the pit road by Kyle Petty. Apparently he has a flat tire on that car. It looks like the left front might be flat on the car. So they had no choice but to come in and change that. That's going to cost him a lot of positions. He should stay in the lead lap. And we only have 14 cars in the lead lap. But Kyle had been running up in the top five most of the day. Boy, that was just some great action there while we were hearing from Kirk Shelberdine in the pit area. Dale was just trying everything he could to pass cars and get back up there toward the front. Well, he's running right behind Ricky Rudd now, who's running in the third position, so that means Earnhardt is running in the fourth position. There's Dale down the backstretch. Rusty Wallace leads, and as they come around this time, we will have two more laps to go. There's a good battle between Phil Parsons and Benny Parsons. Also involved is Richard Petty in car number 43. Here comes Wallace at the start-finish line. There are two more laps to go. Five miles of racing remain as we watch this Parsons, Parsons, and Petty battle. This has got to be one of Benny Parsons' best performances of the year. His best finish so far has been a 13th at Bristol, and he's well within the top 10. As a matter of fact, he is in sixth position. Having a very good run. You can see Rusty Wallace hit the uh, curving on, with his left front there just a moment ago. It didn't seem to slow him down much. He was about one and uh, three-tenths seconds behind or ahead of Terry Labonte when they came by the start finish line the last time around. So it, Looks like that Labonte is staying at least that close behind him. So you think Rusty has this thing won net? Well, I don't know. I'll tell you, there's so many things that can happen on the road course in particular, but he's going to run hard out. Here's a car. Here's probably. That's
that's Benny. Too bad. Oh, what a tough So play. close he, to the finish. Yeah, he was running so good. Had run so good all day. We just got through talking about it. He's going to get that thing back out there. Yeah. And get him a finish position, though. He should stay in the lead lap, but that cost him a lot of positions. Tough break for Benny Parsons. Meanwhile, here comes Rusty Wallace out of corner number nine. And the white flag is being showed by Harold Kinder. Rusty Wallace has one more lap to go, and he'll have three victories in the last four road races in Winston Cup competition. But there is Terry Labonte, and he is not too far behind. Ricky Rudd continues to run third. But Rusty, it seems to me, if he can hang this car on the racetrack and keep it straight, he's going to have another victory in his pocket. I think he will. He was one second ahead of Terry Labonte when they came across the start-finish line, which meant that Labonte gained over a third of a second on him the last lap, but he just has one to go, and it's hard to make up a full second. Rusty Wallace comes through corner number eight. He has the long back stretch and corner nine ahead of him before the checkered flag. He's keeping ahead about the same distance ahead of Terry Labonte and of Ricky Rudd. Well, he's got the worst of the racetrack out of his way. However, turn number nine can be very tricky. He has to be careful not to get in there too fast and slide high. That's his biggest problem right now. He's coming up on Bobby Hillen. As he goes into that turn, he moves around Hillen with no problem at all, and he slows it down going into that turn, gets her right down on the inside, as we've seen him so many times today. Looks like he's got it made, Bob. Rusty Wallace comes out of corner number nine in the Kodiak Pontiac, slips just a little, but he's got the race one. He crosses the line, and Rusty Wallace wins. Terry Labonte is second, followed by Ricky Rudd, Dale Earnhardt, Phil Parsons, Richard Petty, and the number six car of Mark Martin finishes seventh. I believe Dale Jarrett's going to come home in eighth place, and Sterling Marlin in the ninth position. And unofficially, Neil bought it in 10. There's the winner, Rusty Wallace. And it's amazing to think that this guy grew up on the short tracks in the Midwest. His original home was near the St. Louis area, Fenton, Missouri. He grew up on the short tracks in the Midwest, won an ASA championship, but really has shown most of his strength in Winston Cup competition on the road courses. It, that, I think, is surprising to him. I asked him about that last year after he won uh, his second road course. Here's the last car coming around uh, to cross the start-finish line, and that'll be Davey Allison, who's many laps back. And I talked to Rusty about that last year, and he said that really surprised him that he'd come on so strong on road race courses because he never considered himself a road racer. But, boy, he has adapted very well. It is his fifth Winston Cup win. Rusty Wallace will be coming into victory lane, and we'll be talking with him in just a moment. There are the top five of the Budweiser 400. Well, happy Rusty Wallace. Rusty, what turned this situation around with scoring? Did you talk to NASCAR? Did they do it themselves, or did your crew do it? I think my crew did it. Barry Dotson and Jimmy and Harold Lelly. You know, uh, that wasn't the right deal. There's a single file restarts here at Riverside, and they let Ricky uh, pass a couple lap cars. Uh, the caution flag come out. The la pace car pull out in front of us in the back straight, which was wrong. But we, almost, we had to stop or else, keep, uh, or else hit the car. And so uh, it was two problems out there. NASCAR finally got it right and got us back up front. But, man, I'll tell you, I was a nervous son of a gun because I knew it wasn't right. And I've seen stuff like that happen before, and I was hoping it wouldn't keep it up. Well, it all came out well. Do you realize what the points are right now? I'm not even worried about it. I just wanted to win the first race for this team. And Mobile One and AC Spark Plugs and all the guys at Kodiak, uh, they done a great job. And the points are going to fall or we're going to fall is what I've been telling everybody. But I'm glad to win. Well, you are in the lead in the points, Rusty, at this moment. Huh? What, what are your emotions at winning the last Riverside Road Race? It's wonderful. You know, I won the Winston Western 500. I won this thing. I feel like an accomplished road racer, but I owe it all to my crew and just all my sponsors and everything. It's great. I really appreciate it. And there you have it from Victory Lane. Bob Jenkins. Final chapter in Winston Cup racing written here this afternoon by Rusty Wallace. And he is the new points leader in Winston Cup competition. He leads by four over Dale Earnhardt. For Ned Jarrett, Dick Bergman, and Jerry Punch, this is Bob Jenkins. So long, everyone.